May it please the court, Justin Party, I appear for the appellant. With me, Advocate Johnson, Broughton, and Grant. May it please the court, I act on behalf of the respondent, and with me, Ms. Jackson and Ms. Adams. Yes, thank you. Yes, Mr. Nell. May it please the court. Justice May Party, this is an application in terms of the provisions of Section 319 of the Criminal Procedure Act. The rationale of Section 319 is to allow the state a procedure to ensure that trials are error-free of free of legal error. Is it still an application here? Is it still an application here? It is an application. It is a legal questions that were formulated by the by the court of quote for the consideration of this court. Yes, that's what it is. That's where we are. And there were three three legal questions formulated. And the rationale, as I indicated, the rationale of Section 319, Justice May Party, was the learned author Nicholas Stapler, Constitutional Criminal Procedure Act. The work was quoted with approval in the Mitzweni matter, Director of Public Prosecutions, Transvaal v. Mitzweni, at page 230, paragraph 29, where Stapler was quoted in asking whether an accused was acquitted. The question is whether the accused was in jeopardy with regard to culpable conduct. When acquittal was based on a wrong answer to a legal question and not on the merits and appeal on the question of law, although militating against the accused interest in finality cannot be said to be an abuse of the prosecutorial power. To the contrary, and this is the important portion of this quotation, it is a proper application of state power to ensure that the law is correctly applied. That's the rationale. We acknowledge, Justice May Party, that we have two major hurdles to cross. The first hurdle that we have to cross would be the hurdle that was formulated in the matter S v. Siepoe. And we have to convince the court that the court would be able to consider the questions, although there was not a complete acquit. We will deal with that. After that, Justice May Party, we will have to convince the court, this court, that we're dealing with errors of law and not errors of fact. May I refer to that as the Mahmoud hurdle? We have two hurdles to cross, the Siepoe hurdle, the Mahmoud hurdle. In terms of the Mahmoud hurdle, we will deal in our submissions, firstly, with the erroneous application of the principles guiding circumstantial evidence, and more particularly, in excluding very important circumstantial evidence by the court of court. With that, we will deal with the erroneous application of the law in dealing with a plethora of defenses by the court of court. Then we will deal with the erroneous application of the principles of those of incharges to the facts as found by the court. We will do that. Justice May Party. And of course, you'll set out what those principles are. Yes, indeed. Justice May Party, we want to acknowledge up front that we were not happy with the factual findings made by the court. But because that is so abundantly clear to everyone, we are very cautious in our heads of argument, and will be cautious today, not to attack the factual findings of the court, but to deal with errors in law. So if I may then deal with the Siepoe hurdle, we have four submissions to make. But you have to deal with factual findings insofar as it's relevant to the assessment of the legal principle. Indeed. Whether those facts as found to be proved were properly dealt with in terms of the necessary legal principle. Indeed, Justice Leach. And if there was erroneous application of the legal principles as far as circumstantial evidence is concerned, we will be making submissions that certain of the factual findings that the court made, the court never applied. So on the Siepoe issue, Justice Leach, we have four submissions to make. Firstly, the court of quo did not, as the court did in Siepoe, view a competent verdict, a decision on a competent verdict, as the same charge. In Siepoe, 
the court made a finding indicating that a finding on a competent verdict, that a charge is a charge of which different convictions would be possible. What the court quoted, the court quote clearly indicated that the accused was acquitted and discharged on a charge of murder, and the court said instead convicted of culpable homicide. So the court of quote correctly, with the utmost respect, dealt with a competent verdict as we understand and as we, as we will make submissions, section 258 should have been understood. Section 258, we say, just exclude the requirement by the state to list alternative counts. It is a competent verdict can be nothing else but alternative counts in terms of 258, which exclude the requirement from the state to list them. We say that the court acquitted exactly that. Can I just ask you, <clears throat> would it have been sufficient if the court had said, simply said, the state has not proved the offense of murder and stopped there and then carried on, that's not the end of the matter, and went on to consider culpable homicide? Uh, again, Justice Mbappé, that would have had the same effect. I say that if, if, if the court would have said the state did not prove, it is, with the utmost respect, the same as you acquitted on okay. the count. Yeah. So if the court said that, but the main question, Judge Mbappé, would be that how one would view a conviction on a competent verdict. We say respectfully that a, a conviction on a competent verdict is the same as a conviction on an alternative count. In he was charged with murder, and he wasn't found guilty of murder, and, the, and that, you say, is the equivalent of, a, of an acquittal. Uh, we say, we, I say differently, Justice Leach. I say the conviction on culpable homicide is the same as a conviction on an alternative count. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we say. Sikwe says that, like, tell us when the accused is set completely free altogether. <coughs> so what is the situation here in this particular matter? Uh, just Mr. Lanter, I, I just didn't hear that. I really apologize. I'm saying that in Sekui, it says an acquittal, the meaning thereof is when the accused is set completely free. Yes. That, in this particular matter, what happened? Because we know that he was charged with murder. Uh, just Mr. Lanter, we argue that on the main count, he was completely set free. He was convicted on an alternative count. In Sekui, uh, just Mr. Lanter, at the end, page 104, uh, I, I think it's 104, the court said, we specifically leave it open if accused is convicted on an alternative count. In Harman, Harman, in, in Harman's matter, this, in Harman's matter, wait, Oh, uh, I apologize, I, I get things from behind and... <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I have to apologize, they know much more than I do, so I will have to rely on them. Um, in Harme's matter, the Orange Free State Provincial Division made a finding by equivalent section 369, that was a, the predecessor of this particular article of uh, section of the act as amended is meant an acquittal on the charge on which the accused was charged and acquitted and not the conviction on a possible alternative charge wherewith he was also charged or could be convicted. Mr. In uh, Mr. Lau, I think if I can quote directly from, uh, from Sekui, and Sekui is important because you know that in Mahmoud, uh, Sekui was quoted uh, apparently with approval. If you look at 104B and I'll I'll summarize it in English. It says, by virtue of the above, I'm of the view that where somebody is charged and then convicted on an offense on which he may have been convicted in terms of the provisions of Section 26 with the Cessna of an event, that's competent verdicts. Daar nie gesê kan word dat daar onskuldig bevinding was soos in Artikel 324 bedoel nie. And that's what my, my learned colleague uh, is referring to. So it seems to me that Based on that dictum, what the, what, what the court had in mind, what Rabi 
Jay is referring there to is a complete acquittal. And having said that, is there not a shorter route to the, to the problem that you're postulating now, the difficulty that you say, correctly say the, the state must surmount? Is the short answer not that CIRCUI is no longer good law in view of state versus Basson in the Constitutional Court? Indeed. Things have changed drastically Indeed. since CIRCUI if you read, read Basson. Uh, uh, Justice Majid, I 100% agree. If we find, if we find that Basson has in effect done away with, with Siakui's uh, reasoning and motivation, is that not the end of the matter as far as this particular question is concerned? In, indeed. We, we said we'll be making four submissions. I've made two. The, that's my fourth and main submission, as, as indicated in our heads of argument. Uh, uh, the, the matter in Basson is so clear where the, the court said at page 621 uh, at paragraph 148, there's nothing in this language to suggest that the state may only request the reservation of a question directed at, and that's important, conviction or acquittal of an accused. And so, it, was, it was dealing with the situation where these limitations come from, and that's the case of Adams. Yes, and, and Justice Mpati, we say, and that, as we did in our heads of argument, that Sikwe is not good law anymore. I, I agree, Justice Majid. Basson evaluated <coughs> the Section 319, is the first post-constitutional decision on 319, and correctly interpreted 319, as the court said it should have done, uh, where the court indicated Act 619, one of the consequences of the advent of our constitutional democracy is the requirement that all laws must be construed in the light of the Constitution, which the court did. So the, we make the submission that even if this court would not find that it is bad law, then we, we have a submission on the alternative count and, and the competent verdict. But our main argument is that since Basson Sikwe is not applicable anymore. And therefore, we have a right to argue that the court should make a finding on, on the questions as posed. Because one can conceivably have glaring miscarriages of justice. For example, there's a full trial with all evidence led and the judge makes one or other glaring mistake in the course of assessing the evidence or drawing, uh, coming to a conclusion on the law. Then, the accused, for example, is found guilty of culpable homicide, not of murder. But there's, as I say, a glaring error uh, on conclusion of law. That means that the state cannot appeal because there's not been a complete acquittal. Indeed. It really, it, 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 it's difficult to, to understand why that should be the case. We, we've made the point in our heads, uh, Justice Majid, that that would be absurd to, to even think that. Um, if we get to Mahmoud, it is clear that Mahmoud is also pre constitution because the, the court went so fine, Mahmoud, as to saying, the state does not have the same rights as, as an accused person has. The state is a, a minor partner in this, in, in this trial. So even there, we say that since the advent of the Constitution, both cases should be looked at by, by the SCA and interpreted in terms of the Constitution. But I agree, Justice Majid, I, I do, my main argument on this point is that since Basson, CQE is not good law anymore, and that this court will not follow CQE, and that this court will not require a complete acquittal or risk where the accused or the respondent is set free. So if I make that point on the CQE issue, and if I may with respect, then proceed to our second, and that is to convince this court that we are dealing with errors in law and not errors in fact. Also, we, we, our argument is not an argument masquerading questions of fact as questions of law. Our main argument is that the court misapplied the principles regarding circumstantial evidence. Not only did the court ignore important circumstances, that's the one. Secondly, the court viewed the circumstantial evidence in isolation, which 
We've indicated it goes back as far as the Villiers. Good law on, on how a court should evaluate circumstantial evidence. Not in isolation, but as a whole, as a whole mosaic. So the first point I, I wish to make and I wish to argue. The court, although the court said that the court took into account all the evidence, although the court said I took into account the tampering by the police and what happened in the bedroom, that court only paid lip service to that because that's the last. It's a, a one paragraph in a judgment. The court never went back to discuss the circumstantial evidence in, in, in the, what happened in the bedroom. The court was at pains to follow the evidence of the time since the accused moved to the, to the bathroom, what happened afterwards the court relied on, but the court failed to, erroneously, failed to take into account what happened just before. And that's the most important aspect of this trial. Just because the court doesn't continue to mention something does not mean that the court has ignored it. Indeed. I mean, she cannot. Yeah, indeed. Justice Bartman, I agree 100%. The two, may I make two submissions? Firstly, in the matter trainer that we referred to, um, it, the court clearly said, although the magistrate in that instance made a finding that the doctor was a good witness. Never referred to it again. And that was an error. Because there the court said, although you refer to something, if you, don't ref if you don't use it again, that's just lip service. May I also refer to Singh? In the matter of Singh, uh, it's not in my head, so may I just indicate the citation. It's S versus Singh, 75-1 at page 227, it's an Natal Provincial Division matter. Where the court said, at page 228, at G. The proper approach in a case such as this is for the court to apply its mind not only to the merits and demerits of the state and the defense witnesses, but also to the probabilities of the case. It's only after so applying its mind I'll get there. It's only when it applies, it's, the court will be justified in reaching a conclusion as to whether the guilt of an accused has been established or all reasonable doubt. The best indication, and this is important, Justice uh, Bartman, for my submission, the best indication that a court has applied its mind in the proper manner in the above mentioned example is, is to be found in its reasons for judgment, including its reasons for the acceptance and rejection of effective witnesses. There's nothing further in this judgment indicating that the court either accepted or rejected it. The court ignored it. So Justice Bartman, our respectful submission is that the court paid lip service to it by saying uh, it's, it's the same as the court saying, I've listened to, to everything, I've listened to all the evidence, this is my finding. But the utmost the respect. Finding, we are finding it so irreconcilable with certain circumstantial evidence then you can draw the, the, the inference, if you can call it that, that that evidence was not, in fact, taken into account. Yes, indeed. That, that, that's, that's the point we're making. If, if it just ignored what happened before the time and it's irreconcilable with the, with the rest, that the court did not take it into account. Uh, Justice Bartman, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but if I remember correctly, the court said, I will get back to it later. It will become clear later. It never became clear. It never became clear. So if it never became clear, the court ignored it. Uh, just in part, you, you were reading from the Singh decision. I, I, I was indeed, yes. And then I was handed um, a different document. May I have one minute just to see what I was handed? Uh, it is indeed, it is the, the Canadian decision that we that we made available to the court. R versus BG. Um, may I refer in that particular matter to page 194 at D? At, at D or B? At, at, at D. D. It's from, from C to E, but it's, it's right opposite D, um, Justin Party. 
where the record, including the reasons for judgment, discloses a lack of appreciation of relevant evidence, and more particularly, the complete disregard of such evidence, then it falls upon the reviewing tri tribunal to intercede. It is, it is on point. Mr. Now, would, you, would you mind referring to the paragraph? Our, the printout that I have is different, differently numbered. Would you mind referring to the paragraph that you just read from the Canadian case? I think my colleagues, one of my colleagues has the same problem. If, if, um, if, just, if, if yours just is Majid, paragraphs. I will do so. Um, my junior will just hand it to me now. I, I also have a different uh, document. He is the person that made that available, and I will refer to the paragraph, if you allow me, just yes. for him to look for it. That's a good one. Getting to Mahmoud. Whilst I have R versus B with me, I think it's brilliant where R versus B explained the whole process, where the R versus B said, a court will, will wear two hats. It will be the, the trial of law and the trial of fact. May I just extend that by saying, in fact, three hats. Before you evaluate the evidence, there's the trial of law, the principles, the legal principles in evaluating the evidence. Then you make factual findings, and then it's a trial of law again in applying substantial law. So if that is so, we're saying that the court erred in a hat as the trial of law to understand how to apply circumstantial evidence. And that is a legal question. But if the court did not apply the principles regarding circumstantial evidence, and ignoring evidence, that's a legal question. We, we say that it's so important that if she took into account the evidence of Van Staden and uh, Van Rensburg, if she took into account about the condition of the room, if she took into account that if the scene as depicted uh, on boat to 55, I'm sure everybody knows I can refer the court to the record if, if need be, if she took that into account, it's the fan, the duvet, and the denim. It's impossible. I go so far, Justin Barty has to say, the court ignored the evidence, the most important circumstantial evidence that will make the accused version not reasonably possibly true, impossible. If it did not happen, as he described, how he woke up, how he walked, how he moved the fans, then it did not happen how she left the bed. But the court just ignored it, and that's the most important issue. Mr. Mayor, what I find more troubling is how she dealt with Mangena's evidence. Indeed. She finds that he's an excellent witness, and what, if one reads the record, it's quite impressive on the cold record without having seen the witness and so on. But then you don't understand how she gets to where she does with the fact that she basically accepts what the appellant, what, what, the, what the accused said, that if he had wanted to kill, he would have shot higher. Now, that is completely contrary to Mangena's evidence and his reconstruction. Indeed. So, I mean, the two never meet anyway. That's our the finding that he's an excellent witness and he was never challenged, correctly so, and the ultimate finding in basically accepting part of the version of the accused. The two never meet, and, and that to me is very troubling indeed, uh, just, on the point that you're just making now. In, indeed, just Majid, that, that's a second point. In not, in not only ignoring circumstantial evidence, but ignoring a witness like in trainer that she found to be a, a very good witness. What is even more, uh, if I may use the word troubling, is the fact that his evidence about the deceased standing upright, facing the door, standing right up against the door, was just rejected as it's not important. Um, the evidence of, then it brings me, uh, Justice Majid, if, if the court would allow me, the issue of the finding by the trial court that the accused would have fired higher. I make the two submissions. First, the court rejected his evidence as that of a bad witness. The court said he's a bad witness, I reject his evidence. Then not only did the court accept portions of it about what he thought he was doing, but against his defense. His defense was, and one can trace the defense back. Which one of the defenses? Indeed. But up, may I, Justice Majid, 
Just take the court through how I understood it. If one reads the 115, the um, plea explanation of the accused, it is clear, and I don't have it in front of me, but if I remember correctly, the firing of the shots was, was precipitated by a noise. That's what I said. Not he fired at, at a, a threat. The firing of the shots was precipitated by a noise. Link that to his evidence in chief. Before I knew it, I fired four shots. Now, may I... But he says he fired at the noise. Before I knew it. But he says he fired at the noise. But, uh, so he I, knew he was firing at the noise. Uh, Justice Leach, may, if I go back to my first argument, his evidence now been rejected, but you accept his evidence as far as the noise is concerned. Even if you do, he did not voluntarily fire. He said over and over and over again that he never voluntarily fired. May I refer the court to the Oliveira, the matter of the Oliveira, and for the court, just excuse me, I've got hundreds of papers, I'll find it now. And I'll tell you. Uh, excuse me, just let The accused said the very same thing. In Dolavera, the accused said the same thing. Indeed. Without thinking, I fired. And the court there found that that is completely incompatible with a defense of putative Putative. private defense. 100% 100% that's the point I wanted to make, Justice Lees. And I, I suppose you'll also refer to it later when you talk about the imminent, the, the, the genuine belief of imminent, imminent danger. danger. Yeah, even perceived. Even perceived. Uh, thank you, Justice Majid. May I just, I quote from it where the court said, the defense of putative private defense implied rational but mistaken thought. I mean, and, and that, Justice Leach, that is the crux of the matter. You cannot... Private defense is available to a person yes. who thinks that he's under attack, and there must be some reason for him to think that he's under attack, yes. and that he needs to take these steps to guard against this attack which is imminent upon him. But he's misread the situation, and the person who's attacking him, in fact, wasn't attacking him. I understand, Justice Leach, but what is it? He must still have rational thought. He must, yeah. he must, he must aim his attack on, on what he perceived to be the danger. Yes. And he's not doing that in this particular matter. And, and for me, that is the most important. If he said that, and it was his defense, that he aimed it so at the specific says, threat. I, once he says, I did not have the intention to shoot, he can't rely on that defense. Indeed, Justice Mclanta. But what goes further, further Justice Mclanta, is that the court then elected that defense that he cannot rely on as the main defense in this matter. And that was the issue. And that, uh, Justin Tlantler, is a clear error in law. The, the error in law goes so far as to not only allow a plethora of defenses, but then pick one. And, and it's not an instance, uh, Justin Party, where we argue that the, because the court, because the accused was a bad witness, therefore he's guilty. We never said that. We just said, just in party, that you cannot have a multiple defences, especially just in Slantra, where it excludes each other, where you need conscience actions, and where your defence is that I don't know why the, the shots just went. Then being after finding him a very poor witness to pick a defence for him. Indeed, uh, indeed Justice Bartman, that's how we, we, we set it out in our heads of argument. But uh, Justice Bartman, there's one added issue that he was not only a bad witness, he had, if he had defences that exclude each other. And the one that he elected to use, the court rejected that one and gave him another one. And, and Justice Bartman, it goes further then. The court then accepted the respondent's evidence about exactly what he thought, what he did, and why he did it in making a finding, which is, cannot be in, in line of, of the, the, the finding that you made about his credibility. 
Uh, Justice Barton, what we then say, as we say, the court should have rejected his evidence as impossible if the court took into account the, the circumstantial evidence. And the court should have rejected his evidence because he was a poor witness. Then all that remains is the objective fact. On the objective facts, the accused cannot escape a conviction of murder. And that is what our argument is. Uh, Justice Papati, the <clears throat> other, than, other than the state of the room, of the bedroom, ignoring Mangena's evidence, what other circumstantial evidence is there? The, the evaluation of the circumstantial evidence in isolation. May I refer to one aspect? There's the evidence of Van der Merwe having heard voices at a specific time. And there's the evidence of the gastric content. Now, Justice Mpati, if one views that in isolation like the court did, you could say, one o'clock in the morning, she wasn't sure where it comes from, I, I ignore it. But gastric content, the times in terms of uh, the Dr. Simon's evidence corresponds closely by saying, it's not clear, gastric evidence is, I cannot really accept because there are other witnesses that would say that it's not so. But what is the, the relevance of the gastric content to, to what happened that evening? The fact that the they deceased was awake around about one o'clock that morning, 1.45, I don't have the time with me, I apologize, but if the court would bear with me, and that, that must have been the time when they ate. Because that, that must be the time? That she ate something oh, yes. for, for the gastric content to still be available. That would then support the state's view that the accused version is totally impossible. Is that also that the time when somebody had some voices? That's fundamental, indeed. Uh, that it's so impossible because they were still awake at that time. Why would the court not link the two and see that the only inference is that there must have been, let me put it at the best, discussion whilst she was eating. The court went so far, uh, Justice Barty, as to say that she could have gotten up in the middle of the night and, and had something to eat. That's speculation. The court, would, the court of court was willing to speculate on two things. Firstly, on when she ate. And the, the, the respondent in his evidence said it was impossible. And it was not only impossible because he would have known, is that the alarm was activated. If she walked down, the, the alarm would have been activated. The second issue, Justice Mstlantla, was the issue of the cell phone. Taking, taking herself to the bathroom, where the court said, I think she could have used it for life. If you make that finding, uh, Justice Leach, and that was the first question I got, if you make that finding that she used it uh, as, as, uh, as a source of light, then we go back to the finding of the version of the respondent. That would have been clearly visible. So, by viewing everything in isolation, we say the court erred. And those are the three major points. And uh, just in party, we, we are making no submissions on the screams because the court made credibility findings there and the court made findings there. And we're cautious not to do that. What we're doing is we're making submissions on evidence that was not rejected. Well, can I? Yeah, you, you're talking about screams. <clears throat> I seem to remember that there, there was some evidence that certain witnesses heard screams before the shots. Yes. And the respondent's version is that he screamed before the shots. He screamed before the shots. Indeed. And he said he screamed. We have witnesses saying they heard a woman scream. But what did the, what did the judge below say about those screams? The judge... Um, did she say anything about the screams before oh, the shots no, were fired? She said nothing about the screams before. She made findings of screams during and after. And, and related it to the, the sounds of the bat and the gunshots. 
but just in party. We're so cautious to not masquerade our argument as a rehashing of the facts that we did not even deal with that because, and we said with the utmost respect, Judge Party, we don't think it's necessary for purposes of, of finding on the questions of law to go with it. And when we make submissions, uh, Judge Party, the next submission I have to make would be if the court finds in our favor on the legal questions, what then? Before you get there, can, yes. I, just, can I just raise something with you? which Mr. Ruhr and, uh, and his colleagues raised in their heads. Yes, Judge. Like them, I also get the impression when I read your heads that from time to time it seems as if you are arguing uh, dolus directus and not eventualis. I mean, matters like the gastric, uh, the screen, the cell phone, it's almost as if you're suggesting that this is direct intent. I just want to clarify with you. We, we're not going there. We're no, going we're not going there. Yeah. I'm not going there. Just a minute. Because they make the point in their heads, yeah. and I think rightly so, one gets the impression that you're trying to straddle two chairs, yeah, direct not. intent or dollars of uh, Just Majid, if, if the aim was high, if the aim was at, at the head level, if there wasn't a door, if it wasn't behind the door, uh, I would have made different submissions. But w the submissions we made is that uh, there was foresight, that a person standing behind a door in a small cubicle, if you fire four shots in, into that, a person will die. And reconsideration in the fact that the accused went ahead and fired four shots, not only just one. So, just Majid, we're not going back to those directors. We're going to, to those so eventual. You, so, really, your case turns on and boils down to this. And in the circumstances that prevailed, you're not, on, you're not persisting with the initial. Uh, the initial suggestion that was outlined this, as being the state's case at the beginning of maybe an argument which led to her fleeing and locking herself in the toilet and then being shot. Because of the rejection of the witness's screams, I'm not going there, yes. So all we've got to call upon to decide is whether there was any misdirection and whether the, the finding should have been there was a person in this tiny cubicle when he fired four shots into that Indeed. cubicle Indeed. and that that constituted murder. Indeed. Now, in, in that regard, do you ask that it's murder with direct intent, dolus directus, or dolus eventualis? Dolus eventualis. I beg your pardon? Dolus eventualis. Dolus eventualis. Firing through a door at torso level in, into a f small cubicle that I know, being uh, not an expert, but being trained in the handling of firearms, your, the foresight must be that somebody would die and he reconciled. He must have foreseen, and therefore he did foresee okay. that the, the inference is Indeed. that is to be drawn. Yes. But, then, but then where does the circumstantial evidence come into play? Uh, just in part, I mean, I mean the, the court below found that indeed there was somebody behind the door, and it, it was the deceased, and that the cubicle was small, and if... The, yes. the, the, the respondent fired through the door of that cubicle. The, there so was no room for maneuver. What, what's the circumstantial, the circumstantial evidence that evidence. hasn't been considered? What, where does it help I, you? I make two submissions. My yes. main submission is, if the court took into account all the, all the circumstantial evidence, the court would have rejected this version outright. Outright, not taking into account that he fired high, he fired low, he heard a noise. Because so, so the court would then have decided the case on the basis that there is no version, acceptable evidence from the defence, explaining from the, the objective fact of a person behind a locked door shot four times. Yes. Okay. That's it. That's our main argument. We have a different argument that. Even if he knew she was behind the door, the deceased in this matter, it's still dolus of insurance. But um, I think it would suffice for the purpose of this argument to say that. Even on the finding by the court below exactly. that he didn't know who, that it was the, the deceased behind the door, that doesn't matter. Indeed. It doesn't matter. We've got a different submission saying that he knew, but, but be it my adjustment body, I agree 100% that it doesn't matter. And that was our argument in a quarter quote. 
Um, I am not, with the utmost it might, it might matter only in regard to the question of motive, indeed. which might be relevant to the question of sentence. In, in, indeed. But are, are, you, are you happy that we are to approach this matter on the basis that you seek ultimately a finding that even if he was under the impression that the deceased Reaver was in bed or somewhere else, whoever was in, uh, he had the necessary criminal intent yes. to bring about the demise of whoever yeah. was in, in, in the cubicle. And, and, it, and I agree, Justice Leach, and, and I think it's important for this court to, to make that finding because it, it is, it's an interpretation and application of the law that, and I say it with the utmost respect, Justice Bob, that we cannot allow to stand. And therefore, we say, even on that basis. Uh, and, and that must be so because of the number of shots. Uh, just about uh, I say that must be so because of the number of shots. Yes. Yes. Uh, Justice Mpati, may I take the court through our <coughs> submissions on, if you found in our favour on the legal questions, what then? Uh, Justice Mpati. Whenever I make submissions on something that, that seems so easy for me when I read the Act, I get worried if I don't get any case law supporting my view. Uh, because if I read the Act with the utmost respect, Adjustment Party, 3221, uh, may I just, um, I just opened my criminal procedure Act. May I quote from the Act? Yes. In the case of an appeal against a conviction or of any question of law reserved, the Court of Appeal may. Of any question of, of, of law. It, it's not a question of law by the state. It's any question of the law. May I then read B and C? Give such judgment that ought to have been given at the trial or impose such punishment as ought to have been imposed at the trial. May I just uh, qualify here? We're not asking this Court to substitute the finding and sentence. We're asking this court to substitute the finding but refer back for sentence because I think it would just be fair that if we have a different uh, conviction that the accused be allowed the opportunity to lead different evidence. Well, we, 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 have, we have no choice in the matter anymore. Uh, Bogarts, State versus Bogarts in the Constitutional Court has decided that when it comes to sentence, even in a matter where a conviction is, is substituted with a, with a more serious offence. The, uh, the Court of Appeal can't sentence. It must go back to the Crown Court. So, uh, just so there's no choice in the matter. Yeah. Bogarts is binding law. We have to remit the matter for sentence anyway. And Napolisa as well is binding on us. Napolisa from the same court yes. on sentence. Yes. No, same court, same court. That's our argument. I, haven't, uh, I, have to resp I have to admit that I haven't had access to that, and I didn't think of Bogart's case, but thank you very much. But our argument and our, and our submission is that it would just be fair to go back, because I'm sure that lots of other evidence will be led by the state and by the defence if we have a different conviction. Now, if it's so, and I read, see, or make such other order as justice may require. Uh, justice and party, I think it's clear May I refer the court? May I refer the court to the Pillay judgment? Um, it's a judgment. Even by a judgment party, where uh, let me give the citation. Excuse me. We haven't quoted it in our heads. It's yes, it's for Pillay. the benefit of my colleagues. I remember it very well. <laughs> <laughs> I always get worried if I have to do that because I'm sure that you know it better than I do, Judge. Um, it's 2004-2, South African Criminal Reports 419, SCA. Now, what happened here is, and it's just to build my argument, excuse me, uh, Judge McBarty, <laughs> what happened here is the state argued that some of the people that were acquitted should now be convicted because of the, of the appeal. And the court correctly said, 
that only in respect of a judgment order, which is a subject of an appeal, would the court be able to substitute the sentence or the conviction. So even in Palais, the court keep the door open to say that we will substitute the sentence if there's an appeal. So, and I agree 100% with that. We have an, um, I don't know if to call it an appeal, but we, we, we have a question of law that will Remember. dictate that this court substitute the finding as was made provision for in Palais with one of murder. Didn't, didn't this court do that in Porat? Indeed, in Porat. Yeah, the, the court did it in Porat. In Porat, they substituted, uh, and that would have been um, uh, in making that finding. Uh, this court is in called upon to make a to draw a, a, make a factual decision, which differs from that of the court below, because the question of intent is one of fact. Uh, of, the, of, the, of criminal intent is one of fact, and do you say that we can draw that? that we can draw the necessary inference from the surrounding circumstances indeed. that the courts are quote, should have drawn. Yes, indeed. Indeed, that would the, be the only uh, argument that we would do. Um, and may I also quote another judgment that Judge Leach, uh, Justice Leach and Party would know well. Attorney General Eastern Cape is a D. It's 1997, one South African criminal reports 473 is in the Eastern Cape Division. Where it's a 1997 one. Criminal reports 473. Uh, may I quote? from page 475 at H. In any event, I do not think there's a reasonable prospect of success in regard to the constitutionality issue. An appeal is not a retrial or a trial that now, it's merely obliges the court to make a decision on a record of the evidence placed before the court of quo. As such, it's an extension or continuation of the list between the state on the one hand and the accused person on the other. That would allow this court to do that, which I just suggested to the justice. The difficulty that the state has, as I see it, is section 3224. Yes. I'll it looks innocuous in the whole construction of the, uh, of the section. And if you read it as section 324, uh, it becomes even more innocuous. And the second part of that difficulty for the state is Mahmoud, where the court seems to accept, without debating and discussing the matter, that if there should if the court finds for the state in the case of an acquittal on appeal, the matter must be remitted in terms of, of three to four. Yes. So that case stands in your way, isn't it? May, may I make submissions on that? The well, I, I think I, I have a different view of the matter, but I'd like to hear you first. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. Justice uh, Majid, three to four is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Uh, With, I, I, I beg your pardon? It's a necessary condition to have a retrial, a trial de novo. Because 324 is in case of an acquittal. Hmm. It's in case of an acquittal for this court to order a trial de novo. That is what 324 would, would give this court. Of a total acquittal with somebody is, is, and it also deals with the issue of double jeopardy. Yeah. Without having this particular provision in the court, every accused and every respondent would have said double jeopardy. But this entitles the court to order a trial de novo. But that's even more so if you read section 324, it deals with what we know as procedural defects. Indeed. In other words, the accused wasn't really acquitted on the merits, yes. but there was some defect in the proceedings. And, uh, and in those instances, justice requires that there be a retrial. Yes, and, and, and I agree 100%. No, not retrial, I say that this court will have the power to substitute. Because in, in terms of three to four, it reads whenever a conviction and sentence are set aside by the Court of Appeal on the ground. And we say that in, in, in light of our argument that the court should reevaluate the evidence, there's an error made by, by the Court of Appeal, 
and substitute that error with one of, of murder. Um, in the, in the Mahmoud matter, Justice Majid, the court indicated that neither the respondent nor the appellant uh, argued for a retrial or had any stomach for a retrial or was keen to, I, I think the words used, Justice Majid, was keen for a retrial. May I say that I don't think either of us, and, and I talk on behalf of, of Mr. Ru, would be keen on a retrial. But may I, may I say that if that is the only way, if that is the only way, and I'm not saying it is, Justice Majid, if that's the only way of correcting an error made, that is the way that uh, we should follow. But I, I do, my main argument is that the court should substitute and correct the clear error by convicting just on the ob objective fact the accused on, a, on account of murder and a further matter back for evidence. Those are my submissions, Justice Mpart. Can, can I just <coughs> clear the question of the first question of law reserved? Yes. The first question of law reserved. Was that really a question of law or was that a matter of fact? Um, my respectful submission, Justin Party, it, it, it's a question of law in the following argument. W when we argue it, our argument is when the court has the three hats, the first hat is a trial of law to conceive the principles of donative in charges, to correctly conceive and to correctly apply it. That is what that question is. It's not about making a factual finding. No, but dolus eventualis is a, is, a, is a form of intent, isn't Indeed. it? And you get to it by either through the mouth of the accused or by drawing inferences from the proven facts. Yes. So it's, an issue, it's a matter of fact. It's an issue of fact rather than the question of law. Um, but the, my respect of submission, just partly, is, is, is different. In, in our argument is the following. And you correct, Justin Barty, may I just quote Birkus's matter? In Birkus's matter, the court said Which that- Which matter? Birkus. Birkus. We've, we've co quoted it in our heads. Uh, the chances of an accused admitting or if it appearing from other evidence that he had indeed foreseen a remote consequence of very thin, a court therefore draws an inference concerning an accused state of mind from the facts which points to it being reasonably possible, objectively seen, that the consequences would eventuate. But that is just uh, the point that you made. We're saying that, as was said in Mahmoud, if the court made factual findings, like the court did in paragraph 18 and 19 of our heads, we, we set out the factual findings, the application of the principles of Dolus Eventualis to those factual findings is an error in law if you wrongly apply the principles. You may then, in applying the principles of Dolus Eventualis, reach a fact as far as intention is concerned. But the mere application of the principles of Dolus Eventualis to the accepted fact, that is a legal question. Well, what, what are those principles and how do you apply them? Uh, you have to, you have to take into account all the evidence. You have to take into account the evidence of, uh, the, of the fact that um, if the accused had a defense of putative private defense, if he complied with all the provisions of putative private defense, what the court, out, may I just in part indicate how we say the court erred. The court erred in the evaluation of the principles of Dolis Eventualis by not evaluating the evidence, taking into account three things. The principles of Dolis Eventualis, a possible defense of putative private defense, and error objector. The court just wanted to apply the principles of Dolis Eventualis in isolation without taking the other two into account. And that is the error in law. Just my party, may I just say that, and I say it with the utmost respect, the court correctly defined the risk of insurance. One can get that from case books, from, from law books. The, the no, it did. It did. Yeah. But it's the application of that which you find in the case law that's an error in law. And the error here is that the court never took into account 
the principles of error and objective. The court said on two occasions, the accused could never have foreseen that he could shoot the deceased because she was in the, in the, in the bedroom. Not saying, not applying error and objective facts. Once the court tried, and, and, I, and I use the word try and I do it with the utmost respect, uh, attempted to say, or any other person for that matter. Well, that's exactly what it said. She said, how could the accused reason we have foreseen the shots he fired would kill the deceased as he thought she was in the bedroom? So that's just a misapplication of what, of what Dolus Eventualis was. Yes, indeed. And the issue was not whether, whether it was her. The issue was related to the person that was in the cubicle. Indeed. Who ultimately turned out to be poor Reba. Indeed. And in, in our discussions, we said she had to keep three balls in the air at the same time. Dolus Eventualis, Peter of Self Defense, and Aaron Objector, which he didn't do. And, and Justice Leach, if that is true, well, if she's she confused to self defense with intention as well. It's relevant to intention, but it's not exactly the same thing. Yeah, but it's relevant. But Justice Leach, if in the way that the court just said she misapplied the principles of Dolores Vinciales because of the question she asked, that, we say, just in part, is the legal error. Not the finding of having applied the principles, but the application of the principles, as Justice Leach has indicated. So that is my argument, Judgment Party, on question one. Yes, thank you. And those are my submissions. As a court pleases. May I, just Majid, I, I promise that to get something as far as R versus B is concerned, it's paragraph 33. That, that I 33. Thank you. That's a good piece. Where do you find I'm sorry to interrupt you. Where do you find the, Oh, yes. <coughs> yes, now I do have them. Yes, Mr. Mm -hmm. May I please report to you? Can you just give me a moment? Yes, Mr. Roo. Thank you, Justice McCarthy. The starting point on behalf of the respondent is that if you consider the questions reserved, that those questions do not constitute questions of law. And what fortunately happened, in addition to the cases referred to in our heads of argument, the state made available a copy of the Canadian law R versus B, and we will extensively refer to R versus B in order to endeavor to demonstrate to you that the questions posed could never be questions of law. We, we still maintain that the attack by the state on a trial court's finding is on the basis, and I quote verbatim from the heads, is that the trial court allegedly followed a fragmented approach to evaluate the circumstantial evidence. That's in paragraph 26 of his heads. And according to the state, that's still in paragraph 26, the fragmented approach would be in the trial court's, and I quote, willingness to exclude dealing with the evidence that would conflict with the finding 
the trial court intended to make. So if I read that correctly, the state refers then in paragraph 31 to the alleged exclusions. When it first starts to submit that, the court made the following mistakes in regard to the gunshots, and I will deal with everyone. Secondly, in regard to the messages. Thirdly, in regard to the cell phone. Fourthly, in regard to the gastric emptying. And lastly, to evaluate the gastric content with the evidence of Ms. van der Merwe around the argument. Now, first of all, we submit that the court did not ignore the, the evidence or did not exclude the evidence. We've shown you to the, we've pointed you to the, or directed you to places in the record where she deals with it. She deals with every aspect. She explains and she had, and, and maybe it, it's important to appreciate this, that when the court refers to saying that she took into account all the arguments as submitted also by the defense and the accused counsel, regard must be had to the fact that she had very detailed written argument before the, before the time, consisting of 200 pages, about 70 pages, setting out timelines and dealing with every contention raised by the state. Like, for instance, it was raised that they're not screaming before the shots. Those, the screaming there before the shots was the screaming before the cricket bat noises, not the real shots. The court was at pains to, first of all, assess the evidence. To say, but on your client's own version, there would have been screaming, not not from. That is so. That is so on his own version, but it was not mm. heard. No, no one gave evidence about that. But what the court did was to say that the first step was to determine whether there was first what what happened first, the first noises, and the second noises, and it was quite clear that, and the state in fact presented the evidence that the shots must have been first because of the cracks through the bullet holes caused by the cricket bat. So that was common cause in the trial. That it was first the shots and then the noises, which could be confusing, made by the cricket bat. That was not in dispute. And if that was so, and on the state's own evidence, on Professor Simon, on Dr. Stipp, with that fatal wounding, it was not possible for the deceased to have screamed after the shots. So the court very correctly approached the matter there and say, when I deal with the screaming, and that was of course in the context, and I understand not to confuse it with the Dolus Eventualis case, in the context of Dolus Directus, it could not be because the deceased could not scream. And then she found the ring and truth in the neighbor's evidence to say, but they heard a man and they're right next door, and there's a ring of truth there. And by virtue of expert evidence, she found the witnesses on behalf of the state dealing with the screaming and calling that and referring that and interpreting that as a woman screaming as unreliable, and she was quite correct. The same goes if I take every second, every other point, and, and ultimately it takes me back and I understand that, but I have to first clean the slate. It takes me back to the respondent's version. But before we get there, in fairness, if you get to the messages, the court correctly deals with it because all the messages were before the court, hundreds of them WhatsApp messages, loving, three or four fights between them. She describes it. She says, that is what I see in a relationship. But it doesn't take me anywhere. And she's quite correct. The third one, the cell phone. She says, well, I have to speculate. What is it that the state wants me to find in regard to the cell phone? Is it the state's case that 
on this main case that the respondent was chasing her to the bathroom and she says, wait, let me first take my cell phone before I run? Or what was it? And she says, I don't know, but I'm not going to speculate. One point, for instance, in approaching Blom's case, in looking at inferences, is it was dark. Possibly she took it with. I don't make a finding that she took it with. I'm simply saying to the state, there are many possibilities. And I'm not persuaded that it's one in favor of the state that would compel me to reject any other version as being contrary to it. She by has flying a the phone test. in the toilet and the t also locked the toilet. Yes, yes, I would also have locked the toilet when I had someone screaming that is danger. That sounds to me very natural. But according to the defense version, she was supposed to be sleepy. She yes, was supposed to be in the yes, bedroom. Absolutely. That is if we look objectively back. He did not know, but of course that's the important part. The respondent did not know that the toilet was locked. That's an objective fact found retrospectively. That can't be held against him. I was just talking about a version, see it from the state side, on the state's analysis. The same with the, the eating. There was, there was ample evidence on that, where Professor Simon himself said, we must be careful. It's not exact. We had Professor Ludlow saying that we have fasted patients for six hours and found gastric content. So it's not exact. And the court was not then bringing out a finding and say, well, I found that she got up at night. It is the main finding by the court is, if you look at the evidence, it does not give me the security to draw one inference from that, excluding the other inferences. And she comes back in dealing with all the evidence, I will come back to that. The argument, the fundamentalist evidence was not that she heard two persons argue, she heard a woman's voice in an opposite direction. Then you have, countering that, the security guard, Mr. Baba, who was in that time, between around about 2, 220, I think the exact time was 220, 221, right in front of the respondent's house where they had to activate a guard piece of equipment to say, I was here, I was doing my rounds. And there was no problem. Everything was fine. So it is unfair to say that the court just ignored evidence. The court took everything into account. And what we say, even so then, if we take that evidence and we say, now, what, what does it mean in the context of the case? Let's assume that the state, for purposes of today's proceedings, is correct. What would the screams mean? Would it mean that it gives rise to dolus eventualis? That cannot be. The screams has no relevance to dolus eventualis. The screams only had relevance to the state's main case, to say she was running away from him screaming. Forget about that, it could not have been. Yes, I understand the state doesn't persist in trying to persuade the court that that's what the that, finding should be. That is so, Justice Leach, but those are still the factors that he raised in order to criticise the judgment and to say that the trial court followed a fragmented approach. Those are the very factors relied upon by the state to say, look at it. This is not a factual finding. It is a, and we say that it's masqueraded, but I'll come to that, to say I rely on that. That's my opening gambit. I, as the state, rely on that to say she did not take that into account. Therefore, she did not. It was a fragmented approach to the circumstantial evidence. We say hey, it's not so because we can point out every place on the record. But we say even if it were, it does, it does, it's irrelevant. We're really busy with irrelevant. Ultimately, we'll come back to the respondent's version. That's why we were of the view what could have been placed before the court was the respondent's version, for, and then to consider that. But 
the difficulty was that the state needed to find or to construct questions of law from factual findings. Mr. Dick, can I ask you, like I said to Mr. Nell, the one thing I find troubling, and I noticed that in your heads, you deal seriatim with the aspects they raise in their heads, paragraph by paragraph, but what you don't deal with is the matter that troubles me most, is Mangena's evidence. But, I mean, if, if it was excluded, is that not a misdirection on the application of the law to ask the question that was asked in Mahmoud, referring to the, the judgment of Fetum J.A., is to ask this question. Do the proven facts show that the crime has been committed, the crime of murder through dollars of Injalas? Just, just Majid, can I go to Mangena's evidence? Very good witness. I say that I submitted that to the, to the trial. I, I, I didn't cross-examine him. On, 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 on most of the essential things. He was an important witness. He was the witness that eliminated the state's case where it started off with saying that the respondent was chasing the deceased on his legs. And he said, it cannot be. He was on his stumps. It cannot be. I did my test. Mangena's evidence would not contribute other than to explain the shots read with Professor Simon's evidence. It must be borne in mind, if we think away the Dolus director's case, how would the respondent have known what the position was of the person behind the closed door? Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why it's important. It's important because his reconstruction shows that the person on the other side of the door was quite close to the door in that small confined space, and that person was standing upright. Now, even on his stumps, the accused aimed towards bodily parts where fatal wounds could be inflicted. That's the importance of his evidence. And that brings us back to Dolus Eventualis, which I'm sure we'll deal with thoroughly later. Yes. But, but that's the importance of his evidence, is it not? Forget about Dolus Directors, we're not there. But, but that part with respect, Justice Majid, I will come to when you fire shots into a door, what it means. Bearing in mind, that the accused is familiar with firearms. He is, he also uses ammunition to his knowledge, which does great damage to bodily tissue. Those are all factors we must consider. Just Majid, I hope to make it clear later on that ultimately we have to consider the version of the respondent in relation to what he thought. That the firing of the shots, it must create a difficulty. And you would have seen in my heads of argument with great respect that I did not deal with that extensively to make submissions to say that when you fire four shots into a door that you would not foresee certain consequences. I did not make that submission. Can I ask you something? There seems, as I pick up from what this record was, that there was a reconstruction available in court of what, the, of what this uh, toilet cubicle looked like. Yeah. We've got photographs. I haven't been able to find in the record the dimensions given. I, I thought they were there, but it, it's relatively small, but if I may explain... Well, I, I, I don't thought... think relatively is strong enough. It, if, if you look at the photographs, there's room behind there for a, uh, a toilet bowl and a person and just about nothing else. Well, what, what there was is about, if I show, about 75, three-quarters of a metre of wall where the toilet was, so there's room for someone standing behind the wall. Well, the toilet doesn't... the toilet's exposed. If the, the door's side. open, that, that little wall provided no cover. No, that, 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 that is not so with respect, uh, Justice Well, if Beach. you look at the photographs, yeah. it was very, very restricted yeah, If cover. someone stood behind the wall, that person was covered. It was not in front of the door. If someone stood behind the wall, but it was how, definitely... Was there enough room for a person to even get behind the wall? Behind the wall? Yes. Absolutely. Well, if you look at the one photograph with, with the, the rods through that, and it's taken from above. There was no place to hide in there. No, that, 
That that would from the side angle going to the no to take, the toilet just take him from above. Just you can see there is, there is no place to hide. If you put four shots through that door, you must surely foresee that you're going to shoot someone. All I can someone. say is in the submission, because it's not before you and I've seen the toilet, there is a wall, and if someone had been behind that wall, it would have been safe. Well, between the, court, the toilet. the court below says there was no room for manoeuvre. That is so, that is so, and that's the finding. Mm. But... And wasn't that correct? Wasn't that a it's, correct one? It's correct in relation to the objective facts, Justice Leach. It's true if you look at the objective facts where the person was standing and you fire shots through the door, there's, there's no place for manoeuvre. On the facts found by the court, on Mangena's evidence, that's correct. Is we know. No route to move. So if you knew that somebody was behind that door, if you look at the photograph that is in volume, what's this? Volume 12, I think it is. At page 2450. If you put a few shots through that opening, there's nowhere to hide. It'd be a miracle if you didn't shoot some. I, 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 I saw the place and I know there's a little wall, but <laughs> I'm I, sure you did. I accept, Justice Leach, where the person was ultimately standing. And, and, I, and I think it can be dealt with with this that if it was not excluded that you thought that the person was standing behind the wall, it follows. That, that creates that difficulty, but I, I, I'm in a position to deal with it. He knew that there was no, behind. yeah, and he also knew there was no room to manoeuvre. <coughs> then you put four, not one shot. Through the I, I, I will, for present purposes, I will accept that the person was not covered by the wall and that by firing shots into the door that the, at least, the possible consequence and the, or the probable consequence even would be that you would injure the person and probably or possibly kill the person. I accept that for purposes of this appeal. But I say, and that is coming, and if you would allow me, I will come back to that in relation to the respondent's version to say if that would make a difference in relation to the legal points reserved whether that would ultimately in law make a difference. And that will be the point. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to stay clear of the factual inferences caused by shooting into a door, but rather whether that had any role to play in the assessment of what's in the mind of the person. You, you, you accept that, that if um, four shots would face through that door, the in, almost the inevitable outcome was that a person would, would have been injured. It, 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 it would be very difficult for me to make a statement to the contrary, very difficult, and that's why I did not make it to my age of argument, very difficult. But we say that before we get there, and that's what I was trying to do before, deal with the state's real submissions and the attack on the trial court's approach. Because if it was not a fragmented approach, then, and if I may, if I may refer you at this point to the decision of R versus B. Mr. Deville, would this be a convenient it, time? Indeed. To take Thank you, Justice Department. Yes. The court will adjourn for 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, let's take volley mics. Uh, yeah.
Nie, je kany. Je kany. Wat alle skyfalle. Wat je jene nou? Maak jen. Jene waar ik nou praat. Nie, je kan nie, hy is vast. Hy is so, dit is ook om gehad het. Hy is, hy is vast. Die, die ding is nie, so en jy kan dit nie doen nie, want um, hulle sit hulle boeken en alles is hier so, jy weet, hulle skyf die mics weg, dat hulle boeken kan pas. Jy kan nie, hulle skyf die mics. Henny, 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 ek kan nie die goed, ek kan dit skyf soos dit was, nee, dan skyf hulle dit net weer die pad uit. But if they're going to move it away again, they might just move it further away. So what I want to do is, I see, you see mic 2, I don't, you can't see it, but it's facing like the opposite side already, you know, so what I want to try and move, do is move it back, but I would have liked to put this cables on the back, you know, not... The, you know, over the over the counter, because then it maybe would, would, would work maybe a bit better. But then I'm scared the fucking stuff is going to stop working. Uh, you see, this this mic one, it's still like it was from the beginning. You know, because I taped it so down on this table, you can't move it anywhere else now but mic 2 they shifted yeah I wish I could have rerouted these cables eh? High Court in Pretoria did not take into account circumstantial evidence when handing down Oscar Pistorius' culpable homicide conviction. Prosecutor Gerry Nell has argued that Judge Tokuzile Masipa ignored the vital evidence of a ballistic expert. The court rejected his evidence as that of a bad witness. 
court said he's a bad witness, I reject his evidence. Then not only did the court accept portions of it about what he thought he was doing, but against his defense. His defense was, and one can trace the defense back. Which one of the defenses? Indeed. But I'll, may I, Justice Majid, just take the court through how I understood that. If one reads the 115, the um, plea explanation of the accused, it is clear, and I don't have it in front of me, but if I remember correctly, the firing of the shots were, was precipitated by a noise. That's what it said. Not he fired at, at a, a threat. The firing of the shots was precipitated by a noise. Link that to his evidence in chief. Before I knew it, I fired four shots. Now, may I... But he says he fired at the noise. Before I knew it. But he says he fired at the noise. But, uh, so he I, knew he was firing at the noise. Uh, Justice Leach, may, if I go back to my first argument, his evidence has now been rejected, but you accept his evidence as far as the noise is concerned. Even if you do, he did not voluntarily fire. He said over and over and over again. The court then accepted the respondent's evidence about exactly what he thought, what he did, and why he did it in making a finding, which is, cannot be in, in line of, of the, the, the finding that you made about his credibility. Uh, Justice Bartman, what we then say is we say the court should have rejected his evidence as impossible if the court took into account the, the circumstantial evidence. And the court should have rejected his evidence because he was a poor witness. Then all that remains is the objective fact. On the objective facts, the accused cannot escape a conviction of murder. It's all about the talk about law and fact. We have in studio with us uh, from KG Tsarkesis, Incorporated Specialist in Litigation, Dino Tsarkesis. Now, about law and fact, break, the, break that down for us. What does it actually mean? Well, Harry Nall pointed it out quite nicely. He said, you've got to first apply the law, see what law applies, then present the facts, and then reapply the law to the facts that have been presented and accepted by the court. So the law is the applicable principles that will apply to the accepted facts in mm -hmm. the case. He also indicated that the court ignored the circumstantial evidence. Well, he did. Uh, whether that's correct or not is to be decided by the five judges. So far, it, it, mm -hmm. it's going quite well for the prosecutor, Harry Null. They, uh, they might lean in favor of, of his argument that says that the court made an error in applying the legal principle to the facts that were accepted. Mm -hmm. The common cause facts are quite simple. Four bullets went into a door which killed a person, happened to be Reba. Those are the facts. Meanwhile, this is what the defense had to say. It is unfair to say that the court just ignored evidence. The court took everything into account. And what we say, even so then, if we take that evidence and we say now, what, what does it mean in the context of the case? Let's assume that the state for purposes of today's proceedings is correct. What would the screams mean? Would it mean that it gives rise to dolus eventualis? That cannot be. The screams has no relevance to dolus eventualis. The screams only had relevance to the state's main case, to say she was running away from him screaming. Forget about that, it could not have been. Yes, I understand the state doesn't persist in trying to persuade the court that that's what the that, finding should be. That is so, Justice Leach, but those are still the factors that he raised in order to criticise the judgment and to say that the trial court followed a fragmented approach. Those are the very factors relied upon by the state to say Look at it. This is not a factual finding. It is a, and we say that it's masqueraded, but I'll come to that, to say I rely on that. That's my opening gambit. I, as a state, rely on that to say she did not take that into account. Therefore, she did not. It was a fragmented approach. 
to the circumstantial evidence. We say hey, it's not so because we can point out every place on the record. But we say even if it were, it does, it does, it's irrelevant. We're really busy with irrelevant. Ultimately, we'll come back to the respondent's version. That's why we were of the view what could have been placed before the court was the respondent's version, for, and then to consider that. But the difficulty was that the state needed to find or to construct questions of law from factual findings. I'll find out from our reporter on the ground, Criselda Lewis, who is at the SCA this morning. A very good morning to you, Criselda. What is the latest there? Good morning to you, Alva. Certainly compelling arguments from both the state and the defense. Certainly the state saying that uh, Oscar Pistorius should be charged with murder, saying that Judge Togozile Masipa had erred in her misinterpretation of the law and essentially that she had ignored crucial circumstantial evidence. We saw the uh, Barry, uh, we essentially saw here now pointing to the uh, condition that Oscar Pistorius' room in, was in and also pointed to the fans, the positioning of the fans um, in Oscar Pistorius' room on the morning that he shot and killed Riva Steenkamp. But we saw Barry Rue also stand up there, the defense saying that there's simply no way that Judge Togozile Masipa had uh, not made um, uh, inference to crucial evidence in that she'd taken all of the evidence into account. Uh, much more certainly we're going to hear from that when we get back inside court. But let's check now to our legal uh, analyst, uh, Brenda Wardle, about uh, the proceedings inside court. Brenda, yes. thank you very much for your time. Um, the state clearly indicating that Judge Togozile Masipa erred in her, mis in, in her interpretation of the rule, and essentially she did not take into account crucial evidence. Especially, I think if we have been listening to Justice Majid, mm -hmm. especially because when he raised those limitations to the state and he's saying, if there is a clear injustice, why is it that the state should not be granted uh, leave to um, appeal? Not only on the questions uh, of law, but uh, the state should actually be afforded that opportunity and then he, he also hammered on and I think Barry Rue is in uh, quite a corner currently because he's trying to sway the court back to the legal questions to say well they didn't really uh, formulate their questions uh, uh, properly but the judges keep co going back and saying look look at the size of uh, the cubicle and that for Justice Leash there is no way you could fire you know four shots through that door in that confined space and expect a, a human being uh, to remain alive but definitely uh, fireworks in court and here now obviously abandoning dolus directors yes. and and sticking to dolus eventualis saying that is what he wants uh, the court to take into consideration uh, what do we gauge from this point about uh, the state probably quite early yes. but uh, in terms of the state the state uh, we saw one of the justices saying that it doesn't seem whether uh, Gerinel uh, is speaking to Dolus Eventualis or yes. Dolus Directus. I, I think I also got a sense that Geri is slightly confused because if he wants the court to take into consideration what occurred prior to that, uh, the gastric uh, emptying, the contents, etc., etc., then he's actually going the route of directors. And I understood when the judges said, please clarify uh, your situation. Are we talking eventual? or are we talking directors and then immediately said no we we stick by uh, dolus eventualis and then they said well set out the principles if your first question you are reserving a question of law and not a question of fact please tell us what the principles of, of dolus eventualis are but the CEQI judgment which I mentioned earlier would be a stumbling block I think uh, judge Majid basically threw that out of the water by saying look there's the Basson decision of the Constitutional Court, which is more binding and, and, and actually binds this court as well as all other courts, etc. And perhaps it's time to revisit Siakui, especially in the light that Siakui was a decision reached by this very court prior to constitutionalization. We see quite a lot coming from uh, uh, the, the, the judges as well with regard to questioning the defense on why they're not raising the point that Mangena's evidence yes. was not really. Uh, 
uh, uh, taken into account uh, yes. during the trial? Because they say uh, Judge Masipa basically said he was a credible witness and she, she, she applauded him for that and then she goes and she ignores uh, the evidence that uh, Captain Mike uh, Mangena had actually led. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if we recall the trial, that must have been the most brilliant uh, testimony of all the witnesses. That was the most credible. And for her not to take that into account and not to take all the other circumstantial evidence into account, I think, might lead us seeing that, uh, you know, these questions being um, revisited and, and the court entertaining the matter. About to refer to the Canadian case R versus B, and there are four really important passages in the case dealing with the distinction between a question of law and a question of fact, and I make the submission that it's not really different to the cases that we refer to in our heads of argument. But what, what is significant is in R versus B, the Supreme Court of Appeal referred inter alia to the Sunbeam case, also Supreme Court of Appeal cases, and Lampard's case. And if I may go to paragraph 23 of the decision, where they, the Supreme Court of Appeal reversed the Court of Appeal's judgment on the basis that they could not have intervened as the points considered by them <coughs> did not constitute points of law. They say the following in the middle of the paragraph, uh, in reversing the, the this decision. They say, namely, that a guilty intention existed in the mind of the accused. In allowing the accused appeal to this court, the judge held that a person's intention is a question of fact, and that in criminal cases there will always be some evidence upon which to rest an acquittal. It goes on to the bottom, in the last part of the quote, where it says, in the case at bar, the onus was of course upon the Crown to prove that the appellant did not, did the acts complained of with the guilty intention specified in the section. If the learned trial judge erred in finding that the onus had not been satisfied, his error was one of fact, certainly not one of law in a strict sense. It, it goes hand in hand with the decision that's in the head note. I think that, that's, that's true, that if you have regard to the evidence and the inference, you ask to draw an inference from, because it's the only way you can look into a person's mind is from, you judge uh, the subjective intention that that person had by his actions and from the surrounding circumstances. And if that inference is then drawn, it is that he did or did not entertain the intent to kill. That's a, that's a factual inference. And, and, and that goes further. In a, it, it's later in paragraph 29, but it's in a head note where it says, of the same decision, where it says, an acquittal based on an erroneous conclusion of reasonable doubt constitutes a question of law but then it's important where the trial judge is erred as to the legal effect of undisputed or found facts, rather than the inferences to be drawn from such facts. And that's, that's what we submit in this court. Ultimately, when we consider the evidence of the respondent, it is true that it, to some extent it was a vacillation, but I, I think that we can explain that. And, and I, I'm sorry for doing this, and I won't go to every passage, because we've marked them. Are you finished it, with R versus B? Are you finished with R versus B? I'm finished with R versus B. Because I'm not. Um, <laughs> and if you go further and look at paragraph 31, or, or lower down in paragraph 29, <coughs> We cannot regard the provision as excluding the right of the Appellate Division Council, the, the Appellate Divisional Court, where a conclusion of mixed law and facts such as the guilt or innocence of the accused depends as it does here 
upon the legal effect of certain findings of fact made by the judge or the jury, as the case may be, to inquire into the soundness of that conclusion, since we cannot regard it as anything else but a question of law, especially where, as here, it is a clear result of misdirection of himself in law by the learned trial judge. So if you don't appreciate the law, then it's a, then it's a misdirection. And I, further I on, in paragraph 31, a question of law may also arise, it seems to me, when the trial judge misdirects himself or herself with respect to the relevant evidence. Indeed, the Court of Appeal in this case reversed the acquittals after concluding that an error of law had arisen due to the trial judge's failure to properly direct himself to all the evidence bearing on the relevant issues. So, if you fail to direct yourself to all the evidence bearing on the relevant issues, then there has not been a proper legal application. Then that is a question of law. And that's confirmed further if you go on paragraph 33, which is a passage I think that your, your learned authority read, but it goes on in, in paragraph 34. There is a distinction between reassessment by an appeal court of evidence for the purpose of weighing its credibility to determine culpability on the one hand and on the other, reviewing the record to ascertain if there's been an absence of appreciation of relevant evidence. The former requires addressing questions of fact and is placed outside the purview of the appeal tribunal. The latter inquiry is one of law, so that is reviewing the record to ascertain if there's been an absence of appreciation of relevant evidence. Um, it indicates a lack, the latter is one of law because if the proceedings indicate a lack of appreciation of relevant evidence, it becomes a reviewable question of law as to whether this lack precluded the trial judge from effectively interpreting and applying the law. So if you don't take certain factors into account, which should have been taken into account, you therefore, and in, in dealing with a legal issue, then the trial judge who does so effect is, cannot effectively interpret and apply the law. I think that, that must be a correct exposition of the law. Well, is that, is that not, is doesn't that, that give you considerable difficulty? No. I, I don't believe on the factual basis, if you look at what the trial court did, and that's what I was at pains in the beginning to say. Let's look at the analysis. And I'll come to the respondent's case. Let look, let's look at the analysis of the trial court approach to the state's evidence. The we'll trial look court. The approach to the, the question of dollars eventuality. Yes. That's, you'll find, at page 329. I now deal with those eventualis or legal intent. The question is, one, did the accused subjectively foresee the deceased behind the, the door? And two, notwithstanding the foresight, did he then fire the shots, thereby reconciling himself to the possibility that it could be the deceased in the toilet? Yes, but I, and I will come no, to that. Isn't, isn't that an incorrect the law? But Is that not an incorrect application of the law relating to dolus eventuality? I have just the wrong page reference. I was trying to find it to get the exact one. Oh, sorry. It's 1707. If that's the blue number. Yeah, yeah the blue number. 1707. The difficulty that I have. I think if, if you read the judgment before that, what the court was doing was to first deal with the state's case. We dealt with dolus directus yes. and found no dolus directus, and then went on to deal with the question of dolus eventualis. Yeah, but what, what is important is that it was all connected. When she dealt with dolus directus and in rejecting the state's case, she made certain factual findings that then spilled over into her approach to dolus eventualis. Maybe so, but this is her analysis of what the issues were in regard to dolus eventualis. And were they correct? I will submit they weren't if I may explain it, if I may make the submission. Because that doesn't seem to me to be dolus eventualis. 
Because there, and this is where the area in persona comes in, there the whole definition of dolus eventualis is defined solely with reference to Reba, whether he knew she was in the toilet at the time he fired the shots. And is that not a misdirection of law? I, I submit not. Because she goes on to immediately find that this court does not support the state's convention this, that this could be dolus eventualis. On the contrary, the evidence shows from the onset that the accused believed that at the time he fired the shots into the toilet or the deceased was in the bedroom. But he can be convicted of murder on the basis of dolus eventualis even if he did think that she was in the bedroom because his criminal intent is defined at the person, whoever that person might be, in the toilet cubicle. So was this not a misdirection of law? I, I, I submit not. And, and the reason why I say this, because that's one part of her finding, and it must be read with her factual findings before you can't, it can't be isolated with respect, Justice Leach. And if I may explain. Well, I need some explanation yes. as to why what she says is the test that she has to deal with with those yeah. eventualis can be correct. If, if it seems to me to be not. If, if I may first summarise, and then I will go yeah. back in more detail. The trial court, in analysing the evidence, first rejected yeah. the Dolus Directus approach. Yeah. And in finding there, she found, made two crucial factual findings. The one factual finding was that he genuinely believed that he was in danger. That's the one factual finding. The second factual finding... Well, I'm not sure if that is so, but let, if you can draw me... I, I will refer to the passages. Of the, of the findings. But it's a chip that if I may just yes. give an overall approach. Yes. So the one factual finding that she made is that he genuinely believed that he was in danger and was acting in danger. The second factual finding was that he genuinely believed that the deceased was at the time of the firing of the shots in the bedroom. Yes. And, and that can't be ignored, those two factual findings. No, I understand that. Now, it was in the context of that when she considered Dolus eventualis to say, because it can't be isolated from the state of mind of the uh, respondent. And that's why she correctly, she absolutely correctly referred to error in persona or error in objective. But say, that, that's not what it's all about. Because if I may use an example, if I shoot someone thinking it's A that's going to attack me, and I really believed I'm under attack. Error in objecto does not come into it. Whether the person was A or B or C, it does not matter. And that's what the trial court was at pains to say. She said, I look at error in objecto and I understand. I understand the principle of error in objecto. If I shoot someone and I have a mistaken identity, that, an identity, that in itself cannot be a defense. Which makes my difficulty even more pronounced, that she did correctly set that out earlier, but when she comes here, and this is her finding, these two pages are the findings upon which the whole case turns, insofar as Dolus Eventualis, she never deals with anything effectively but Dolus Eventualis is excluded because he did not know that she was behind the door. That, that's on the one point, but it cannot be isolated with respect, Justice Leach. If, if I may take you to your analysis. You see, I accept the two premises that you say she'd already just found. But in the light of that finding, her analysis of Dolus Deventuanus, it seems to me, is wrong. I, I, I think that. Because the issue was not then whether Reva was behind the cube, was whether he knew Reva was in the cubicle. The issue was he knew a person was in the cubicle. But, but, but I, I respectfully submit that, that not, that's not even the issue. If, if of course you, it's the issue. If you would allow me just to take it back to the two factual findings. Yeah. And assuming that the factual finding is that he shot because of a perceived danger. If, that is a different if, issue. If that's the factual no, finding. The issue of whether there was 
the so-called putative self-defense which is being bandied around is something else. We're talking about intent, not unlawfulness. Putative self-defense has to do, well, self-defense has to do with unlawfulness. Putative self-defense has to do with culpability. But we're talking about intent is to what was foreseeable. But, but that's exactly the point, that, um, the submission I'm making, Justice Lee. I, I submit that you, you cannot, from that piece of the finding, cannot isolate the factual finding that he genuinely believed that he acted in danger. No, but that, because let's not get sidetracked by that. When he fired the bullets, did he know there was somebody behind the door? Well, if I may use a different example, Justice Lees, I, I walk to a place and I fire shots through a door. Yes. I know there's a person and of course I'm guilty. Of course I'm guilty. Unless I say I fired those shots because I believed I was right in firing the shots. Yes, no, I understand that. But, but, but that, goes, that goes to the question of culpability. What we're dealing here with is the assessment of whether he, not, and culpability in appreciation of whether he acted lawfully. That is not what is dealt with here. What is dealt with here is whether he foresaw. I, 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 and, take, and, the, and, the, and as I read the judgment, the judgment, and you must point out to me where I'm wrong, he says it is not dolus eventualis because she, he did not foresee that it was Riva. Just if, if, if I may explain it in this way and make the submission, and I come back to what I've submitted, just for present purposes, accepting that a factual finding was that he believed that he acted in defence, it follows that there's one substantial ingredient absent in his actions for liability, and that is that he believed that he acted lawfully. There was no intention to act unlawfully or the knowledge of unlawfulness. So that's missing. And that was the judge's approach. And, and it must be read with that, with that. So it was the finding by the trial court to say, that is my factual finding. Now, when I now look at dolus eventualis, I need to consider two further questions. Because what I do not need to consider what I do not need to consider, once I find that there was an absence to act unlawfully, it does not really matter who was behind the door, save for the following. And that's where the finding comes in. She says, or the court, I'm sorry, I apologize. The court says, there is of course one instance, and it's not in so many words, but if you read the finding, there is of course one instance where you believe genuinely believe that you're firing shots at an intruder, but, but, you foresee and reconcile the dolus eventualis that it might not be an intruder, it might be the deceased, and it's in that context that that, that passage must be understood. Where the judge, where the trial court found and say, I've already found now, absence of one of the elements of the dolus but now I must go further. That in itself is not good enough. I must now consider even accepting that he lacked the necessary intent for murder. Did he not perhaps foresee that it was Riva in the toilet? The deceased, I'm sorry. And did he not reconcile himself? And in that context... Of, of once, if you gave to come with a defence of putative self-defence. And I think you can be hard-pressed to bring the facts of this case within that. But if you do come with that, then it's a question of culpability. And that question of culpability wouldn't matter whether it's dolus directus or dolus indirectus. I, I agree. So it wouldn't be necessary if, if, they, if, as you said, there's already been some sort of finding that's there that Dolus, that, that it, there's a lack of culpability to read issue it. I mean, one just can read what the judgment says. But, but, but I, I, I can't, with respect, I can't take that part of the judgment and, and, 
isolated from everything else. And what I'm trying to submit is if you read it with a finding, what the, judge, the trial court was really doing to say, well, I found now as a fact that there was a lack of intent to kill. But now I must consider, did he not perhaps think, because that's the intruder theory, and I give him points, I, I, I bring that finding out in his favor on the facts. I do that. But now I must consider, did he not in the back of his mind entertain the thought that it could have been, or that it was perhaps, the deceased. And that's what she's doing there. She's, she's saying, I cannot find on the Avenger in view of what she's found before. I cannot find that it was Dolus Avenger in the sense that he had Dolus Avenger vis-a-vis the deceased because my factual finding is that when he fired the shots, thinking it was an intruder, he genuinely believed, he bona fide believed, that the deceased was in the bedroom. And that is absolute, un in law, a correct finding on an analysis of a previous factual finding in relation to Dolus Evangelis. But the court now moves on. The court is at that point busy dealing with Dolus Evangelis. And the learned judge said, the question is, and then those are the two questions but, that she asked. But, but I fully agree with what the trial court was doing, Justice Bartman, if I may explain again. She's now already found that he genuinely believed he fired the shots at the intruder. Mm -hmm. That is now the end of the Dolus directors. Now she thinks with that finding in mind, is that good enough to absolve him from Dolus eventualis? And she says, well, Let's see, we know it was in the toilet, and I, and I will develop it, but let's see, could he not perhaps have thought in firing at the intruder that it was the deceased, and therefore his absence of knowledge of unlawfulness would not carry conviction right through. It would assist him, because if he thought within the time, uh, the, the, the frames of Dolus Eventualis, if he thought that it might be the deceased in the bathroom, it would not assist him that he genuinely believed that he fired shots at an intruder, because that would only assist him in respect of Dolus directors. Therefore, if I look at Dolus Eventualis, I now narrow the question. I've already made my factual finding. I now narrow the question in relation to the deceased, and I say, I cannot find Dolus de Vincialis because my factual finding is that he genuinely believed that she was in the bedroom. It's in that context, and, and that makes sense to me. Yeah, but that but makes but identity, sorry. sorry, that makes identity part of the inquiry. No, it, it does not with respect, and if I, if I may explain my submission. The identity she dealt with, and I, quite correctly, the court found it is so that if you have a mistaken identity, that it does not give you a defense. But now I find in this case, I make a factual finding that he believed it was an intruder. Whoever that intruder was, that, that identity with one player role, because it's now dealing with the culpability. The only time, and this identity of error and objector would have no relation to a consideration of Dolus Eventualis in relation to the deceased. Because she says, I must just now consider whether he did not perhaps think, entertain, that it was not an intruder. So identity does not in that respect come in. We all know with respect. I, I cannot argue that if you make a mistake as to identity that you can hide behind it. But once you don't have the required culpability, the required intention, it does not matter. It does not matter in law. And that is her finding. So uh, she was quite uh, correct in saying... What, what is your case in so far as, as this intruder is concerned? Well... The, contru intru the issue. Well, if I, if I may... He hears a noise. This is a person... He's not confronted with a person. He knows the person is behind the, behind the door. 
and he hears a noise. Could he honestly and genuinely have believed that he was entitled to shoot that noise? To kill whoever was responsible for that noise? Well, if because that must be, that has to be established before you can have your putative self-defense. Well, I, I, I approach it differently, but I, I will respond to the question. My submission is different with respect, Justice Leach, and that is that the court analyzed, the trial court analyzed this evidence. Because this is now not leaving out part of the state's case, because I've, I've demonstrated that. Well, the, court, the, trial, it's, the trial court analyzed this evidence and found him to be a shocking witness. Yes. And an unreliable witness. But then she said that she, his version, the accused suspected that Mantruda had entered his house through the bathroom window and that he genuinely, although erroneously, believed that his life and that of the deceased was in danger. There's nothing as a whole to, on the evidence as a whole, to suggest that this belief was not honestly entertained. Well, was there anything that showed, apart from a noise, that his life was in danger? Or that he could, that he honestly believed that his life was in danger? Well, I know we live in times where people break into your houses and <laughs> things of violence, but this is a person in a small area, he's armed with a firearm, he went to confront the noise, armed himself, went to confront the noise, and then indeed what happens is a noise, and then he shoots it. If I, if I may turn it around in answering the question, I'm sorry, I'm not debating. If I may turn it around, would the finding be he's lying, he was not scared, he did not believe there was someone, and why was he shooting three o'clock in the morning into a door? Who would be in your house three o'clock if I find that you genuinely believed that, it, that the deceased was in the bedroom? That would be the converse. That yes, cannot no. be. No, but, but was his action in shooting into the door, would he have had an honest and genuine belief that he was entitled to act that way? We submit, yes, and that was the trial court's finding. And this, this, it, it's not that you disregarded evidence there. The, state, the state's evidence factually played no role there because I've dealt with that. It was premised on a very different basis. This was now a pure analysis by the court on factual content before her. And that's a factual question. And what, what will happen if we reconsider that question and say, court, trial court, you were wrong. When you found that he genuinely believed that it was an intruder, you were wrong. Your factual finding was wrong, and we're going no, to I'm make it saying, a legal finding. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, um, that that was wrong, but was there any, on anyone's version, or on a finding, that his life, a genuine belief that his life was in danger. But, but again, that's, that's the court's factual finding, and, and what this court will then do is no, to interfere. No, see, I don't believe there has been a factual finding made. You show me where the factual finding has been made. If I may just go to the places. If I must just go to the various places, if you would allow me, Justice Leach. I've marked them. If you just bear with me. with a factual finding is it's a factual f the closest I think one gets to it is that the statement that I put to you that he said this was his version and it hasn't been disproved by the state uh, but that doesn't that isn't a positive fact of finding that he genuinely entertained this belief it goes especially in the light of the fact that she has found him to be in, uh, such a poor witness who's given conflicting versions as to why he shot if you would just bear with me, I'll find which you said was in line. If you just bear with me, I've got, I've got a note of all the places. That's fine. If you just bear with me, I've got, I've got a...
she starts with the process, or the trial court starts with the process 1704 at the bottom. Where the court correctly said the starting point, however, once was whether the accused had intention to kill of whom he mistook the asset. Then she goes on what is stated. Well, she goes on to say the accused had the intention to shoot at the person in the toilet, but states that he never intended to kill that person. In other words, if he raised the defence of putative private defence. Well, if, that, that doesn't follow. If, if I may go to page 1706. Or do you say it does follow? It, the, the, what follows after that? No, I'm she saying to you, not, not that in itself. No. No. So, so there's a misdirection. At the top of one seven oh five. No, that, that's not with respect to misdirection. She says, it's, in, it's a statement in, that she says. He never she intended says he to states kill. Yes. That he never intended to kill. In other words, he raised the defence of putative private self-defence. He did. No, he didn't. That doesn't flow. Well. I can, I can take you to many, Putative many places. Putative private defence is what is then set up um, yes. by Smallberger J.A. in the Dolivera case, which immediately follows that, which is not the same. No, you what, can have intent to kill. What is, what is not the same? From time to time, he said, I fired and I don't know why and I didn't mean to kill. Yes. But other cases he said, I fired... At the noise. At the move, I believe the person was coming out and that I was in extreme danger. That's what he says repeatedly. Yes, but why did he believe the person was coming out? He heard the noise and he says there was a problem with the door when you opened the door. And the door didn't open. But he wouldn't know that at that stage. Well, he's standing there, the door's in front of him. He but didn't see is, the person. That is, that is now... He didn't know whether this was a 12-year-old child or a person armed with a submachine gun. No, but that is also thinking away with respect. There stands a man on stumps. He's vulnerable. He's extremely anxious. We see it now from eyes where we look back. And we cannot do that with respect. We must take it in its totality where this man is standing there. And it starts before where that anxiety started when he's going to the bathroom believing, incorrectly that. so, that I there's a problem. I understand that. Why else did he shoot? Because he perceived that there was a danger, that there was someone in his sleep. But, but if, if that is correct with respect, then he could not have wanted to act unlawfully because he believed the fact that he was wrong is something else. That's culpability, that's, cul that's he, negligence. Did he believe that he was entitled to shoot in those circumstances? His version is that he believed his life was in danger and he discharged the shots. So you have to read in it. It's, it's not a lawyer. That must, that must be bona fide. But it was found to be bona fide. If the, and I was coming to the passage, and that's the factual finding. And if we reject that, of course, if it's rejected that factual finding and say, well, he was not bona fide, he just shot for some reason three o'clock in the morning, then I have no case. But then I don't know why he shot. Then he wanted to commit murder on, on someone in the, in the toilet, believing that the deceased was in the bedroom. Why would he do that? It does not make sense. It does not accord with common sense or probability. <laughs> but when you look at the whole picture, the court found at page 1706, she talks about his erroneous belief that his life was in danger. And they say then as a fact, there is nothing in his evidence as a whole to suggest that this belief was not honestly entertained. She goes, that's a finding. After she dealt with that for four or five pages, where she rejected something, they say there is nothing in the evidence as a whole to suggest that this belief was not honestly entertained. Then she goes to 1709. Where she says, the fourth line, it follows that the accused erroneous belief that his life was in danger excludes Douglas. That builds on that finding and she goes on again to 1726 and 1727. Where she says, from paragraph, uh, I'm going too fast, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Department. It's 1726, which talks about his version again from line 18. And she's, the version of the accused was that he fired the shots in the toilet because he thought there was intruded inside the toilet. The sequence of events, namely the shots, the screams, the shouts of help, 
the sounds of the cricket bat striking against the toilet, the calls made by various witnesses to security to, reward, to report screams and or shots are more in line with the version of the accused. That cannot be ignored. And again on 1727, 11, uh, line 11. From the above, it cannot be said that the accused did not entertain a genuine belief there was intruder in the toilet who posed a threat to him. That's four times... Sorry, sure. what's that last paragraph? I'm, I'm, I apologise, Justice Leach. I was a bit quick, I realised. Yeah, it's one, page 1727 from line from 11. Thank you. So four times that you come out with the finding that he genuinely believed that he was in danger and that's why he fired. Now, that is the point that we raised right in the beginning. And the first question that must be considered by this court with, with great deference is whether that finding is factual or not. And it is a factual finding. That finding is not where she left out facts that the state is complaining about. That finding is solely premised on what she listens to, what she observes. And she comes to a finding that I believe in, in saying that. And the quality of that finding is this. And she says that. That I'm unable to find that he had the necessary intention to kill him. What she meant clearly by that when she dealt with the elements is that he had the necessary intent to kill unlawfully. That he believed that he was right. That's a factual finding. And then when one develops that factual finding, it, she then acquitted him. And I'll come back then to the second point. And she says, but that's not good enough. The fact that you genuinely believe that does not absolve you from liability. And I find a guilty argument on culpable homicide. Because you were just so wrong. You were wrong. You were just so wrong. But I'm unable to find, in fact not unable, I'm unkind to the respondent. I found as a fact that was your genuine belief. That's the factual finding and that's what we repeatedly said in the edge of argument when we come to this court. It's a factual finding that and whether the court considers that to be wrong, and that's also in the Canadian law, uh, if I may refer to the uh, R versus B case as well, where it says, uh, it's paragraph 22, just as in party, where he says, however wrong, the court of appeal or this court may think that it was in reaching this conclusion. I'm of the opinion with all respect for those who hold a different view that his error cannot be determined without passing judgment on the reasonableness of the verdict or the sufficiency of the evidence. And in my view, these are not matters over which the Court of Appeal has jurisdiction. And that's exactly our case. So we submit, once it's, once it's determined, and it is, that that's a factual finding, right or wrong, then we must develop that factual finding and say, where does it take us in law? Can you reintroduce then intent? And that's where the judge was correct and say, but I'm not going to stop there. Let me now consider, did he not perhaps, and I'm going to not to repeat, did he not perhaps take him away from this intruder? Did he not perhaps think it was Riva? And then the court brought out that finding and say, no, I cannot find Dolus Eventualis in respect of that because he genuinely believed, factual finding, that the deceased was in the bedroom. And it's in that context that the finding is absolutely correct. But are, the, but are the questions that she asked correct with regard to Dolus Eventualis? Yes. She, Did she, the accused subjectively, subjectively foresee that it could be the deceased behind the toilet door? Is that, is that one, what, what, one, what a judicial yes. officer asks but, in these circumstances? Yes, but, is it not that, did the accused subjectively foresee that if I fire through this door, the person behind will be... No, with respect, not. not. Not in the context. If we have an academic debate, that's the question because we have to consider it an objective. But she has already made a finding now about the intruder. It's, you don't reconsider and say, well, I've already found that he's not guilty because he believed it's an intruder. I've already found that. Now I'm going to stick to an old definition, not the old definition, an open one, and say, well... Did he think there was a person behind the door? That's irrelevant because she's dealt with that. The moment she found that he believed it was an intruder and she believed that excluded Dolus, that was the end of that exercise. So you don't reintroduce 
Then she, did, then she didn't have to deal with Dolus Eventualis either. No, she, she had to. Because oh, the right. question is then, her finding was in respect of an intruder, her factual finding. Mm. So she did not have to introduce the wrong person, mistaken belief anymore. Because she's dealt with that. Whether it was mistaken or not, she found an exclusion ground on Dolus in law. And she correctly refers to the elevator and say that's later on, I'm, I'm confused now. She correctly <laughs> deals with it and say then and bring out the finding. But then she says, that's not the end of the question. I now I've dealt now with error mistaken identity in relation to your culpability. You really thought it was an intruder, it doesn't matter. And that's why she correctly says. I hear you. I understand error in persona. I understand that it's not a defense that you made a mistake. But this is not what the case is all about. Because if you look at all the case laws with respect, most of them have an error in persona where the son or the daughter or the wife or the husband climbs through the window. You have a mistaken identity, but once it has no relation to culpability. Once culpability is not present, it does not matter. She then moves on, or the court, trial court moves on and say, well, that's not the end of the matter. Let me consider now dolus eventualis, but not dolus eventualis as this open concept in textbooks. Dolus eventualis on what's remaining. And what uh, was remaining then? What was remaining was it not perhaps, they did not perhaps entertain that it was the deceased in the bedroom. Yes, but then why does she conclude, if that is so, at 1708, how could the accused reasonably have foreseen that the shots he fired would kill the deceased or whoever was behind the door? So she then brings in Someone else. somebody else. Clearly he did not subjectively foresee this as a possibility that he would kill the person behind the door, let alone the deceased, as she thought she was in the bedroom. And the version of the accused was that he had he intended to kill the person behind the door, he would have aimed higher chest level. This was not contradicted. Isn't there, there a conflation between dolus directus and dolus well, eventualis? Let, let's, let's accept that, Justice. Let's, let's accept that, sir. And let's accept that finding for present purposes is wrong. And let's put it one side. Are it you does prepared not. to accept that this finding was wrong? That this finding, how could the accused accused reasonably of foreseeing the shots he fired would kill the deceased. That, do you accept that that was clearly that, wrong? That's the court's finding. That's as far as I can go. That's the court's finding, but I submit, I submit that it does not resolve the matter. Because if her finding was in the first place... But I'm sorry, before we get there, do you accept that this was an incorrect finding? I, I, I cannot make... Any concession there, I, I, I've said what I said about you it. You had to argue not to make concessions. I had to argue not yet. <laughs> Thank you for letting me off here, Justice Lee. But I, I, I would say it makes no difference. And, and I've referred you to a very instructive article by Phelps at paragraph 32. And if I may just go there. Yes, well, I think the learned author got some things wrong there. Uh, that may be, but if I may refer you to paragraph 32, where the following is said. Just a moment. Perhaps, uh, I'm sorry if I'm a bit weak. This what? The first paragraph starts, as per page 32, starts on the dolus, the eventualis, and the second one. Is that the number 32 or the top 32? The top 32. Typed. The printed page 32. Okay. And, and I found that to be instructive. She says, perhaps on the facts, it might have been less controversial findings in the circumstances of that it was foresight of death. But this was the court's factual finding, and the accused would have been acquitted either way. But then, the important one, even on the finding of dolus eventualis indeterminatus, he would still have a putative defence on the basis of a genuine mistaken belief that he was under attack and acting under lawful self-defence. He would thus lack knowledge of unlawfulness, which would not be impacted 
by the error in objecto. So we say, even if that's the finding, and even if that finding were to be wrong, let's look at the, fi the, the principal findings. Once the finding on the facts was that he genuinely believed that he fired the shots because he was in danger, it excludes dolus, the one leg, it excludes dolus. And that's the end of the intruder line. Well, it doesn't exclude dolus, it excludes the culpable. The, the culpability. Yeah, that, that's why I tried to say the one leg. The leg one leg of over. The knowledge of unlawfulness. Then we move to the second part to say perhaps, maybe he entertained that it was not the intruder outside my finding. And she says, but I make a factual finding that Dolus Eventualis cannot apply because. He genuinely believed she was in the bedroom. So he did not think and did not reconcile himself. Whether he was wrong or right, that's the factual finding. He did not. I find that he genuinely believed at the time that she was in the bedroom. Those would be an answer to the main count. Those would be where the error in objective was consumed and the answer on a factual basis on the dolus eventualis. And then the logic step would then be to move on to say, well, I've given you the benefit of the doubt, and she dealt with it. I've given you the benefit of the doubt, but that's the version. Then I have to move on to, to negligence. And that's exactly what the trial court did. And we say, if we then take the purpose of this appeal before this court, and we look at the questions, we have to do a number of things with respect on dolus eventualis. We have to draw a line through the court's factual finding that he genuinely believed. Whether that's wrong or right. Whether that's wrong or right. We have to draw a line through that factual finding. Because once we keep that factual finding, it cannot follow that he must be, should have been convicted of murder. Once we keep the factual finding that he genuinely believed that the deceased was in the bedroom, we can draw a line through the dolus eventualis in the remaining aspect. And then it's instructive to look at the state's, the, 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 the points reserved, if I may go there. It's page 25 of the Heads of Argument, where it says, whether the principles of dolus eventualis were correctly applied to the accepted facts and the conduct of the accused, including error in objective. I've dealt with that. I've dealt with the factual findings. Be it wrong, be it right. So that first question can have no legal effect for purposes of section 319. It, it cannot be. If you look at the second one, whether the court correctly conceived and applied the legal principles pertaining to circumstantial evidence and or pertaining to multiple defences. What the court did, the circumstantial evidence don't really come into it because the state's circumstantial evidence were all focused on dolus directors. When we look at the accused, where the trial court correctly said, I look at his version, and from time to time, he's saying, well, I did not really intend to shoot, and it was just a reaction and so on, but I find, looking at it holistically, I find on the facts, I give him the benefit of the doubt that he genuinely believed that it was an intruder and that he genuinely believed that he was in danger. That's my factual finding. So it's not the question that she mistreated multiple defences. She says, I must look at it, and ultimately it's not for you to come and tell me what you believe the defences. I must look objectively at the facts. And the fact that you lied is a factor that I must take into account. But that's not the end of the case. And I must ask myself the questions. And she asked the question. She says, well, objectively, the window was open. And so on and so on. So she re refers to a number of factual content to say, well, let's corroborate you. So although I don't like you, I think you're a poor witness. Not don't like, don't like your evidence. I think you're a poor witness. I understand the onus. And I give you the benefit of the doubt. And I bring out the factual finding in your favor. And that's my finding. So the... the point, the second point of multiple defences, she correctly analysed it. She didn't leave out something. 
If you go to the third point, she says whether the court was correct in its construction and reliance on an alternative version of the accused, and its alternative version was reasonably possible to be true. It's actually a rewording of the second point, and he says you should not have found that it was reasonably possibly true. But she did not make errors in law in doing so. She may or may not have, it's not relevant, committed factual errors to say, well, I'm wrong in believing you. I'm wrong that you, ultimately, when I look at your version and it fits in with your screams, it fits in what you told the people immediately after, it fits in with you hitting the door, it fits in with your anxiety. I looked at Derman's evidence, I looked at the two Oscars, it fits in. Though I'm not really happy with you, it fits in. And I found myself unable to reject your version. Now, that is factual. The Constitutional Court in Basson made it plain and clear. If that is a point to be concerned, it's a factual point, you cannot do it. The court does not have that jurisdiction. If I may move on to the second point on 322, Justice Mapati. Yes. On 322... Before, before yeah. you go on to 322, can I just ask you this? Um, or tell me if you're going to address it now. How do you view Siaco in the light of, of the, the judgment of the Constitutional Court in Basel? If, if I may give this answer, you would not have seen in my opposition to the legal points that I raised Siaco, and you would have not have seen in the heads of argument that I raised Siaco. Our reading of Basson was that it's really the end of that approach. You have to give it a constitutional interpretation. And though I understand what the motivation is behind, it's the see a quick case. I'm unable to make submission to say that it's a guillotine point today. I, I cannot see myself doing that. However, I must say, my understanding of Siegui was, I think, was born out of a, the case was born out of a, a practical one. To say, what do we do now? If, if someone at a full trial and he gets convicted now, say, culpable homicide and not murder. And he serves his sentence. And now, for some reason, you s send it back. How are you going to avoid double jeopardy? And, and that same, the same sentiments were raised by Judge Ditkot in uh, Zoko, where he says it's inconceivable. He then distinguished it because he was dealing with 310. But he, he used the words, he says, it's inconceivable that that, that was in mind. But I think, and with respect, I don't want to put it higher, that the practical effect of the CEQI principle would rather, should rather be considered when you consider whether or not to refer a matter back for retrial. That that would make better sense to me. Then all the, all the factors that led to the decision and, and its predecessors. Ab absolutely. That you could yeah. only have an appeal if there was, if it was a conviction and then the state could only appeal if, if the point of law was to the advantage of the accused rather yes. than the state. That, that all those factors would come it, in. It must, it must be that. that that's, that's how we read it, Justice Leach. The, the more difficult part was the 322. It didn't really make that difference to us, but I believe there's one interpretation that if, if, if one considers 322, that paragraphs, sub sections 1, 2, and 3 were intended to deal with the accused position and sub 4 with the state's position. And, and it's quite clear, and this becomes clear when one considers subsection 2 and subsection 3, because subsection 2 and subsection 3 deal with the position of the accused. And then only do we find then what is it then when the state reserves a point of law. And then when one has that in mind, and you go back to the cases. But, but sub one also refers to a question of law. Yes, it ab reserved? A absolutely, Justice McClantla, but one has to give meaning to it. And, and it was not without any pain that I tried to give meaning to it. But if you look at sub one, and you ask yourself, if subsection one was, uh, if one was there, why is there subsection four? Because one says you can do what's in the interest of justice. An interest of justice may be to refer to retrial. It seems that if you read the proviso to sub one, 
It says, provided that if you do it, then you may not do it in certain circumstances, and certain then you must find irregularities, and not only irregularity, but one that would give rise to a failure of justice. It seems that it's all connected to the accused approach, the accused position, and also subsection 3, because there would have been no need, if it was not so, to put subsection 4 onto the law books. And that's what happened in the uh, Rosenthal case, where the court found, if I may just... Where the court found, with reference to the old Criminal Procedure Act, where they inserted in the subsection 322 sub 4, was then 369 sub 3. And the court found that here the accused were acquitted, so the only provision available is 369.3. That's for the state. The only provision. The court says that the only provision for that is nowadays 322.4. And exactly the same approach was followed in Zorko just said about this, uh, Zorko is not important here, I am. In, in, in Mahmoud, to say that's the only thing that we can do. It, it's, it's the only thing, and that was on an interpretation that why is there a 322.4 in that section? But, if, but is the other interpretation not the one advanced by Mr. Nell also, that 322.4 must make provision where there are complete acquittals? And if you look at 324, as I said to him, those are procedural defects, irregularities, and so on. So the accused wasn't really acquitted on the merits, but on some technicality. And there, the legislature had to make provision for the state to have him retried. Uh, in another trial. Now, with respect, though, if you look at 3221C, it tells you that the court can do what's in the interest of justice. The court can order a retrial. It's nothing stop. If that's in the interest of justice, the state does not need the assistance there. It says, make such order as justice may require. No, but that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is this. 3224 deals with where you have complete acquittals, where the, walk, where the accused walks out from the dock outside the, the doors of the court, based on a technicality. For example, as is envisaged in 324, section 324. There the legislature said, so fit to insert a section, subsection 4, to make a provision for the state to charge that accused again. And that's where 322.4 comes in. I mean, why is that not a reasonable interpretation that, that is, other, that, other than the one that you've advanced? That is an interpretation. I, I cannot say it's not an Why is it unreasonable? It's a reasonable interpretation, but... What we're submitting to you is also a reasonable interpretation that's supported by two decisions of this court. Well, can I then ask you this? If you read 3, 2, 2, 1, B and C together, now, you've made the point with considerable merit in your heads that there's grave difficulties in envisaging a retrial in this case because of what's gone before in this case. And I understand that. Bearing that in mind, and considering that the entire record is before us, if we find for the state, why can we not, in the interest of justice, that sub C, be, give such judgment that ought to have been given by the, by the trial court? As I've said, we can't sentence. So, so, so in the interest of justice, why can this court not make such an order? We submit that, and that's again on interpretation. The one is that disjunctively, it's all, or all, all. It's the one or the other or the other. But those steps we submit are there in the case of a legal point by the accused or a conviction by the accused. Because even if you give an acqu a complete acquittal on a legal point in 3221, then if, if 3224 was just meant for an acquittal, Complete acquittal, why can't 3221 with respect not also give rise to a complete acquittal? Well, if, if you can introduce the state's question of law there, 
Sorry, I'm not quite with you there. If I may repeat the submission. Yes, I, I just need to understand this. Why, why do you say that 3221 then can't apply in, in where the state appeals on a point of law, where there's been a conviction? Where there's a conviction? Yes. Not a complete acquittal, but a conviction. It applies, but it's not, it doesn't apply to the state. Yes, but why? It says in a case of a, a conviction, the state would not appeal in a case of a conviction. Why, why would the state appeal? It, it's Thank clearly you. meant with respect to my, my interpretation to say there's the accused is an appeal against conviction. The state does, does not have that right to appeal against conviction. No, no, but, but you must read it further. All of any question of law reserved. I, I and question of law reserved refers to section 319 and section 319, and we know the history of that, of that section in previous acts. Section 319 specifically envisages the reservation of a question of law either at the instance of the accused or by the prosecutor. And so I also, like my brother, don't understand how you get to this argument that 3221, 2 and 3 apply only on your interpretation in the instance of the accused. I don't understand well, if, if we look at, if I may start at the back with respect, uh, Justice Majid, if you look at the back and you look at the proviso following sub 1, it says provided that, and it only deals with the accused there. And sub 3 only deals with the accused. It does not deal with the position of the state. That's why. Whilst when you get to 4, why it do you deals... Say that? What is the, how does the proviso affect it? How does the proviso affect it? The only submission we make in this regard, if you look at the proviso, the proviso has no relevance to the state. Why? Precisely. It, it deals with, it says, when a point is decided in favour of an accused, and then it tells you what the court must do and may not do. But and Mr. the Rook, second one is where there's a conviction. That's only sorry, the accused. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but this is exactly the point. What the proviso does, it makes provision for a certain set of circumstances that may arise where the, where the court finds for the accused. It has no bearing on the, on, the, on the prosecutor. It doesn't mention the prosecutor because it doesn't affect the prosecutor. That, that does not mean, it does not follow, therefore, that the prosecutor is not included in one, two, and three. I'm, I'm having difficulty following your argument. You see what I'm saying? This is, is in to make provision for a set of circumstances that may arise where the, where the accused is successful in raising the point of law. I, it says the conviction on sentence shall not necessarily be set aside. I, and one I, can understand that. From a practical point of view, we know how criminal trials go. Justice Majid, I understand it, but if I may, if I may, if I may go back from 3221 to the word question of law, and I understand where question of law comes from, but so does question of law and sub folk come from, and that's from 319. But that question of law can also incorporate a complete acquittal. Mm -hmm. It does not say in the question of law other than in the case of a complete acquittal. <laughs> and for that reason, we say, if you look at it, if you look at one, two, and three, and it's not without any constraint, it's not that I stand with absolute clarity, I don't. But if I look at that, my interpretation of that is, and that's been the interpretation by courts before, and so that's the only thing you can do. Rosenthal say, that's why 31369 is on the book now. That's why they brought it in, also to deal with the position of the state. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what puzzles me the most on that argument. It's section 324. Do you have any explanation for why six, section 324 only deals with procedural, as a layperson would call it, technical? Technical difficulties. Yes. You see, that's what that puzzles me the most. If, if I and, and there one can understand again why in the interest of justice the legislature has decided you cannot, get, you cannot let an accused go off scot-free on a technicality, and I'm speaking layperson's language now. And therefore, there should be a retrial. <laughs> Conversely, if you've had a full trial and there's been some mistake of law, the state now reserves questions of law and this court on appeal finds for the state. You've had all the evidence. And therefore, why can't this court forget about, I, I take your point that it's dis disjunctive. Why can't the court in terms of 3221C say, in the interest of justice, it's not in anybody's interest, let alone the accused, to have another retrial? 
given what's gone before. And therefore, this court now decides on the record before it uh, what, the, what, the, what the judgment should have been. I, I, Sorry, I've said a mouthful. I, I understood. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Benji. I think that if one interprets Section 324, one would see that it's really designed for an error. And I believe that the legal point is designed, a consideration of the legal point for an error. So it's compatible. Well, not only an error, a technical error, isn't it? Yes, but it's a technical, a technical error. Well, it's, it, it talks about the technical irregularity. Now, technical irregularity, it's a wide concept, whatever it means. Let's say, let's say, let's say the main witness. I'll tell you what that means, in my view. I may be wrong. What that means is, let's say the only eyewitness to the offense was a child. And that child wasn't properly warned in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act before giving evidence. And the judge and assessors, as the case may be, accepts that evidence. And that's the only incriminating evidence. The court is satisfied that that child's evidence is sufficient as a single witness. Or there's other corroboration. But that child wasn't properly warned or admonished in terms of the act. That's the sort of error that comes in here, isn't it? Here we're talking something different. We're talking, for example, and I won't say that's going to be the finding, but let's say, for example, we find that the principles of Dolores Eventualis has been incorrectly applied, and that's an error of law. That's on the merits, isn't it? It's not a technical error. It's an error on the merits. Well, that's how I understand the section, because it does puzzle me why this section deals with the sort of things that we would... The court doesn't have, didn't have the competence to convict, for example. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not an offence over which that court had jurisdiction to convict, for example, treason. Well, I, I, I you understand what I'm saying? I, I fully understand, Justice Majid. I, I think, I think with 3224, with respect what the legislature had in mind, and maybe not with this soberest, most soberest thinking that you can dream of, was to say, well, I am going to afford to the state. I'm going to make it possible for the court to, to order a retrial without possibly scrutinizing the individual content in 324, because 324 is foreign in the sense that it's, it's very difficult to force it into a sum of some findings that may follow on a point of law. Now, you would also know on, on the law on interpretation of a statute. Here, the legislature has stipulated A, B, C. When A, B, and C happens in a trial, the consequence shall be proceedings in respect of this may again be instituted. There's a numerous clauses. It's not, it doesn't say matter where the interests of justice require. It specifically mentions those three aspects. And I say again, those are technical defects in procedure. Mr. Roo, may I have to affirm the judgment? State versus E, 1979 3, which deals with the point. I'll read a head note. It says, where well, court of appeal is convinced that the trial court, because of a wrong finding of fact or of a mistake of law, convicted the appellant of a less serious offense than that which, in terms of the indictment, he should, be, should have been convicted of. The Court of Appeal has the power, in terms of Section 322 of Act 51 of 77, to alter the conviction accordingly. In such a case, the Court of Appeal has the power to set aside the sentence of consent and either refer the case to the trial court for that court to impose an appropriate sentence or itself impose a sentence. That, 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 that's true, Justice McClendler, and I've, I've seen another case as well where they did not motivate it, but where it happened. But then I also see cases where it tells you that the only step that you can follow is that it's difficult. Well, it's, it's a matter of interpretation. It, it's a matter of interpretation. If the interpretation is that 3221 is not only limited to a legal question of law by the state, then it must follow, of course. Then it must follow that the court can apply 322. I, I have a difficulty just to understand 3224 then, what the purpose of 3224 was. Because if a wide interpretation is given to 3221, why, why, why introduce 3224 on a, on, 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 
in the Act, because then you can read a legal question also as be one that would that would uh, follow an acquittal, a complete but acquittal. Maybe, said it's maybe the intention was to make quite sure that if there was a decision was exercised under 322.4, the accused then couldn't raise a plea of autrefois. That may be, and I think a second. But you see, we're be not dealing with an acquittal, but a conviction, but possibly an incorrect conviction. And if you accept that the court would be bound, the appeal court would be bound on the factual findings that are made, but there was an error of law made, then there would be no purpose in starting de novo. And one shouldn't exercise your discretion then under 3224, but you just make the order that should have been made. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, Justice Leach. It, and it would might, in a, in a position like this, operate in, a, in a, an accused's favour, where factual findings have been made that an accused person might be very happy that they were made and not uh, made in favour of the state on certain issues. But then the court is bound by those factual issues, but mainly takes the the final decision that should have been made. Take, for instance, this case. There's been an inference drawn in so far as dolus. If there's been dolus um, uh, eventualis, if the court finds it, for instance, that it shouldn't have been uh, culpa, but it was a question of dolus, you don't want to have the whole thing referred back to start de novo, to go through the whole trial again. Um, it's far easier to say, these are the factual, uh, so the factual, this is the factual matrix. There was an error of law. So the, the, find, the only factual thing that we began going to interfere with was the drawing of the inference that, and draw the correct inference. Justice Leach, I, I, I try to, to make it plain that we also, from our side, we have a difficulty with the interpretation. I could simply give you the yeah. two interpretations. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. I, I understand that interpretation. There are two interpretations. What complicated it is, of course, by virtue of previous decisions of this court indicating to us that's the only thing that can yeah. happen. No, but, I, I but it's open. It is indeed open. If I may just come back to the merits on one point. Yeah. Sorry, can I just add, before you go to the merits, it's interesting that, I mean, my colleague has referred to you state versus E, but in commentary, at 31-39, when the, when the authors deal, commentary on the Criminal Procedure Act, when they deal with the powers of the Supreme Court of Appeal, if the question of law is decided in favor of the state, they say, they refer to the retrial, I quote State versus Rosenthal, as you've done, but they also say the following, and I quote, if the record contains all the relevant information, the SCA may also use its powers pursuant to section 3221 and deliver the judgment and impose the sentence while we leave that aside that should have been delivered and imposed by the trial court if the latter court had correctly interpreted the legal position. But again, they quote no authority, so I'm just mentioning it. Yeah, I, I saw that. If I might just refer to Pillar in this regard, where I thought, and again with great deference, Justice Mbappati, mm -hmm. where I thought that, that the powers really that the court derive with the powers provided for under the end section 22 of the High Court Act to interfere. If I may just go to that passage, it is, and I understand the facts there where there was an appeal and there were acquittals that, which were not really before the court, but, but there was in paragraph 114, it says the powers of a court of appeal are derived from section 22 of the Supreme Court Act, which provides for that. And then section 322, and it's quoted, is then referenced to, and it says, the subsection clearly deals with the powers of a court of appeal may exercise in the instance of an appeal against a conviction or where a question of law has been reserved for its consideration. It does not give a court of appeal the power to alter acquittal order or to substitute it with the finding of guilty. I, I just bring that to the attention. I know my brother presiding was in that case, but they may have been wrong. <laughs> I will never dare to say that, uh, <laughs> Justice Mitch. <Mitchell. laughs> I just referred to that. If I may just come back to one point on the merits, and I, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but and leave the 
factual point behind. When one considers the case and the intention or the negligence, we submit that it cannot be considered by simply saying that you must look at this evidence where it was contradictory and for that reason rejected and find that he did not act in a perceived danger. Because that would so militate against the prevailing facts. It would so militate against all the evidence on record where we have this absolute anxiety that was not an issue. Where a psychologist appointed by the court tried to explain the two Oscars and the one when it's 1.5 meter and his fears and his over fears and his over anxiety and that was also confirmed by Professor Foster is his general anxiety disorder and it's that person that you mistake and see him hearing a noise and with his fight response not the flight response because he cannot run without his legs on on his stumps with that flight response going there and making observations in that condition three o'clock in the morning if you think that away the question is why did he shoot did he just shoot because he decided this is a good time to fire shots into a door it cannot be with respect there was a trigger element for him and that trigger element was a continuous one where he was standing there in that state of mind and when he heard that noise for him it was that's it that's it they're coming out and he says this on a couple of occasions if you draw a line through that and say that's nonsense you're a liar you're a poor witness why did he shoot did he just go to the bathroom to fire shots into a door because it's practice time it cannot be but what also cannot be is that the court give every person with the anxiety disorder a license to shoot absolutely not and we're not asking for that we say that's why we can't generalize we say let's look at this fact are those facts present we're not saying you'd excuse from firing that's why he's convicted that's why he's convicted of culpable homicide because he was not excused but now to impute intention because he contradicted himself when he was trying to explain his state of mind in very very difficult situations is also not fair so we're not saying walk away there was no appeal against the culpable homicide there's no exclusion of liability but to say that that person went there and why did he then shoot if it was not that he was in that anxious moment overreacting but one in his shot. mind one shot here but it's, we're not talking about one shot where you have a trained person you shoot the evidence was in quick succession do 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 that's what it was you trained and you fire shots in quick succession and you should have thought better yes of course you should not have fired four shots you should not have fired shots at all but that does not impact of what his mind was thinking and that's what the case law the way i understand the case law is at pains to say be careful not to say what he should have thought look at his state of mind and all we say when you look at his state of mind you cannot isolate it from who the person is how do you say this case differs from state versus dollar vera um, how does this case differ from state versus dollar vera where the man saw a number of persons in his yard in an area was prone to housebreaking crime and so on and he fired and the court found there was no and the objective facts there was no imminent danger and found him guilty on dollars of insurance but the court the court the court rejected his version the court rejected his credibility that's the difference here we have a very different case we cannot just with respect take the one case and says there's a man with two legs standing there it's not three o'clock in the morning he doesn't feel he must protect someone we have to look at this package the package presented was very different and, and my understanding of the case law however unreasonable you are if that's really your frame of mind that's your frame of mind and the law is not designed to punish you for a wrong frame of no, mind well, what, what the law requires is that you must investigate whether he uh, whether he did in fact hold a genuine belief in the circumstances of the case but if not if he did not hold a genuine belief 
What would one say with respect? Why would he have fired? Are we going back to the state's version that he wanted to kill the deceased, which cannot be, which was tested and rejected? It cannot be. Something must have happened in that man's mind that caused him to fire, and he explains that. If you think that away, there's no answer. There's just a person going three o'clock in the morning to the bed, bathroom and fire four shots on the door. Something must have happened, and he explains this, and the background facts explain it. The experts explain it. It's the package, and it's unfair then to take him and see him now through a prism of someone else standing there at 10 o'clock at night or whenever with two legs on. We have this anxious person, the overly anxious person. We see Dr. Derman's, Professor Derman's evidence, where with all the para-athletes, he scored the highest on anxiety. That's the evidence. He's overly anxious, incorrectly so, but that's who he is. And he stands there, and he's scared, and he sees the open window, and that's what the trial judge was saying. He could see this objective corroboration for him. It's not that the window that he heard was opening was now suddenly closed. It's an objective fact. He's scared. He's really scared. He believes the deceased is in the bedroom because he'd spoken to her before. When he woke up, he'd spoken to her. So it's not that he believed she was sleeping there. He knew she was awake, but he knew she was in the bedroom. That's the finding. Now he fires. If it's not for that reason, and one tries to sit back and think, why did this man then fire the shots? There is no reason other than to accept the state's case, which cannot be, because it's inconsistent with the probabilities. It doesn't make sense. Then there's no reason, and that's unfair, to then impute him with no reason, say you're guilty. The state of mind is there, and it's consistent. But I'm grievous with the merits. Yes. Thank you. Reply, Mr. Uh, I have the submissions I wanted to make. You don't have Can I ask you something on this last point, <laughs> which Mr. Roo has made very emphatically? If we, if, we, if we either are not in a position to interfere with that finding, it being a factual finding, or we do, for some other reason, find that he did not have a genuine belief. What do you say is the reason he fired? He did not harbor a genuine belief that there was an intruder there. I'm postulating it on the basis of Mr. Roo's argument. I'm not saying that's my view. Justice Majid, there could be very many um, inferences drawn. There well, let me ask you this. Let yeah. me ask you directly, because um, this is yeah. really what my question should have been in the first place. Is it necessary for us to find a reason? No, it's not necessary to find. By, because if the, the very pertinent question you asked, just Majid, is the comparison between the two cases. We have to well, I must, I must say, of course, and you would know it as well as anybody else, that one must treat each case, especially when it comes to intent and unlawfulness in these sets of circumstances. Each case must be decided on its own particular facts and circumstances. Indeed, but there, there, there remains a principle, Justice Majid. The principle is, in that particular matter, the court rejected his evidence. Our argument remains that in this particular matter, the, the evidence should have been rejected, but it, but it, it is not necessary it, to make the finding. Well, it wasn't rejected. That's it the is point. not necessary to find why he shot. What we have to know is that <laughs> he did shoot in circumstances where he had foresight and he reconciled. That is the question that this court should ask itself, and that would be the end of the matter. It is the finding that he, that he had, did have a genuine belief that he was, that he was being threatened. Um, is that not a factual finding which bounds the school? Uh, my and if it is, how does it affect your argument? I've got two submissions. Firstly, I say it's a factual finding but it was, the factual finding was made in a wrong application of the law in terms of multiple defences, in terms of circumstantial evidence. If we cannot say that a factual finding wasn't made, it was made, but it was wrongly made. If it's wrongly made, the court can interfere. The second issue is if the court finds that, that there was a belief, then we still have to deal with all the aspects as far as Peter Rip's self-defence that one should deal with. For instance, 
was there an alternative? Because the court wrongly applied the principle of putative self-defense, the court never asked itself the questions. Was there an alternative? Was that the only way? Was there a genuine threat to his life? So those questions, because the, the court of quo asked the wrong questions, was never answered. And this court cannot answer them, because there's no version. As a court of Yes, thank you. Contrary to what I heard earlier in the day that judgment would be delivered today, judgment is reserved. <laughs> Court ledger. The road to greatness.